ahead and get started. I think we have everybody in the room. Um, welcome to the Monday, October 28th special Board of Commissioners meeting. Um, will everyone please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I'd just like to thank you all for being here. I know it's close quarters, um, but I know probably a lot of people will give their presentations and then head out. Um, so I think it's just a more intimate setting. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably a little more comfortable for people to make a big presentation instead of the big room downstairs. It is being recorded. Um, it's not live, but it is being recorded. So thank you, Ian. There you are. Thank you, Ian, for that. And uh, just quickly, I would like to um, thank our township staff for, there were a multitude of fabulous events uh, over the past couple of days, the Halloween trick or treat here at the township building, the um, electronics drop off, which I've gotten so much positive response about from uh, a lot of my constituents in my ward, and uh, the Radnor Run yesterday, which despite the rain was a wonderful event, so Tammy, Hats off to the um, Recreation <coughs> Community Development or Community Programming Group. Uh, I know our <coughs> public works. I think uh, our gentlemen from the uh, Community Development were out. Uh, our police were out in force. And it certainly is a, it is quite a co collaborative effort to make uh, such a wonderful event happen to benefit the Loan Association. So um, thank you, everyone, for all your hard work. So we will begin tonight with public participation. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share uh, prior to us getting into the heart of the agenda? No? Okay, then let's get to it. Uh, we will first start with our administration presentations. Um, our first department up is community development. August 31st, 
Uh, for 18, and you'll see in 19, we're actually ahead of 18 as of August 31st. So it's going to be 2,400 if you have the Okay, thank you. This is kind of just giving a breakdown of the permits and board applications. I think I went back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Pardon me, I'm just. I'm new at this. It's so. all right. It's all right. Take your time. It's fine. The codes and inspections. So our codes department currently consists of two full-time inspectors and one part-time inspector. They're responsible for plan review, helping us process the permits when we have questions. They perform all the building inspections. They uh, graciously hold a lot of meetings with the architects, builders, residents, and staff. They, they actually enjoy doing that. They'd rather sit down with everyone ahead of time before a project starts than someone to come in and they get halfway through their project and not have everything they need and can hold it up. So they do a great job with that. They respond to complaints. They support and respond to the emergency uh, responders. They will go out when there's a fire, if there's a hoarding situation, if something happens in the middle of the night, they're on call. They serve as the township liaisons to the historical board, the design review board, and the zone hearing board. They also attend code appeals, rental housing appeals when necessary. And they coordinate with other departments regarding infrastructure. So we have two full-time and one part-time. Currently, uh, this year, we've had over 1,724 building permits submitted for review. We have done 3,020 inspections, and they've gone out on 108 complaints. We have 3,560 open permits. Each permit uh, has at least minimum two inspections, usually four to five per permit, so they're very busy. These are some of the pictures of some of the jobs they they go out on. So, let's see what they're heading out to. These are some of the things they get to see uh, in regard to property maintenance. <coughs> this is a recent apartment fire uh, that our code official Andy Pancoast was out at. Uh, he was there until he was sure that the building was safe for the residents to stay in and help the residents who needed placement uh, find somewhere, you know, make sure they were pets on like that. They also handle the rental housing inspections. Uh, to date, we have a total of 944 licenses, but 3,424 units. Uh, 70, uh, 62 of them are student rentals with a total of 74 student rental units. <coughs> Our health department, we have a health officer and a health inspector, Marie and Katie. Uh, they review the applications for new food establishments, for bathing places. They perform all the inspections for both of those. They also assess community health needs and provide information as needed to the community. They respond to health related issues, uh, animal bites, uh, food issues, property maintenance, hoarding issues. They'll accompany our code officials uh, for those issues. They serve as liaison to the Board of Health. They support and respond to emergency situations as well. They are on call 24 7. They inspect the temporary food events. And Marie is CPR and AED. Uh, and uh, first aid instructor. So she is uh, <coughs> certified in all of that, sorry. Health permits and licenses. We have 225 food licenses, 33 outdoor dining permits, and 38 pool permits. And um, the health inspector and the health officer inspector all of those. And these are just some of the pictures that they've given us to show some of the things that they've seen, uh, some of the kitchens they go into that they have to make sure get cleaned up. Um, and then they also check the outdoor dining and they attend the events to make sure uh, that the, any food at the uh, temporary events is to temperature and properly distributed. 
the next four items are items that we would like uh, that are on our wants list. So first is the first fire safety inspections. Currently, Radnor does not have a formal fire inspection program for businesses. There are approximately 2,000 businesses in Radnor that are subject to fire safety inspections. The fire safety inspections are intended to identify life safety issues such as danger to the public from fires in commercial properties, danger from property owners' complacence, and injury to local emergency services and first responders. So our dark departmental staff has seen going on their everyday inspections, they're starting to see violations uh, to the fire safety code, such as non-functioning alarms, out-of-date fire suppression systems, and blocked means of egress are, there are common observances. Are they really needed? Here are some of the things that they've come across. So we have exposed wiring, uh, fire extinguishers that are out of date, outlet covers uh, that are not covered and also corroded. We have the panel exposed, which is a very extreme safety hazard. And they've also, they also see a lot of blocked emergency exits and this is a fire connection that is blocked. So the goals of this program that we would like to see put in place are to review safety measures, fire equipment, and address any associated concern from businesses, maintain safe conditions, and undertake fire preventative measures, protect the health, safety, and welfare of the entire community. They will be done annually. The first year of the inspection would be funded by the township, and the following years will be billed directly to the business owners with no cost to the township. These are some of the things that they'll be looking for during, the, during their inspections. And after the inspection, they'll discuss in detail the deficiencies found in the corrective actions <coughs> that they've taken. They'll follow up with a written inspection report to the business and there will be a timeline for the corrections to be done and a second inspection to be done. And this should result to ensure a safer, safer runner. So the comprehensive plan update. The Pennsylvania Municipal Planning Code states that the comprehensive plan must re be reviewed every 10 years. The last time we had a comprehensive plan review was in 2003. So we're due <coughs> and the comprehensive plan is an important tool that sets forth the framework for future development for the town. So the archive file scanning. Historical property files and records are stored in the basement and in the department departmental areas of the building. Files are frequently accessed in response to the right to know questions. Accessing files in paper format can be time consuming. In 2018, the Community Development Department processed 290 right to know requests. This used 73 hours of staff time. Scanning the files will allow for instant access for property, workers, <coughs> for staff, and residents requesting historical property information. And finally, the ECODE 360 map. This is an interactive zoning map, which will allow easy access for residents, businesses, developers, and contractors to the zoning regulation for every property in the township. This includes zoning district, setbacks, coverages, and allowable uses. Thank you for your time. Also, to Andy and Marie are in the back of the room there. Uh, and they do a tremendous job along with Peggy, and they spend a lot of time weekends, evenings, late at night responding to any concerns. And, uh, they're all very dedicated staff members, so thank you. Thank you. But just a quick question Bill, will all these presentations be available yep. for, on the website? Okay. Yes, they will. Thank you. thank you, Peggy. Thank you, and Andy, thank you.
evening, Commissioner. Good evening, everybody. So we're just going to give a more higher level look at the engineering department uh, as we move forward. This is our staff. This is us. Uh, Trish Shoreland, administrative assistant. I just want to say that's somewhat of a misnomer. She is actually our nerve center that keeps us all going, processes permits, deals with folks at the desk, and, and processes all our things. Doug Meter, our in-house inspector. Dennis Capella, our new project manager. Our tasks and duties. Uh, we're also somewhat of a catch-all. A lot of things come to us, try to help everybody out that we can or point them in the right, right direction. Some of the bigger things we have, land development, all land development runs through engineering. Uh, meet with a lot of residents on stormwater concerns, rating and clearing permits, capital projects, UNO certificates. We are the liaisons to the Planning Commission and Shade Tree Commission. We process those permits. Uh, we do inspections on capital projects, grading permits, technical reviews with our consultants. Uh, a lot of assistance, Peggy had mentioned this, spend a lot of time at the front counter with people that come in. And engineering also meets with developers, homeowners, applicants <coughs> to go through their, their application before they submit. And actually we do that together with Tom Dad often. Uh, we respond to emergency projects, that's a 24-7. We assist our other departments. That's part of our charge is to give them technical assistance. Um, so we talked about planning commission and shade tree departmental. So they may come up with a project. We will help them through that, either creating uh, requests for proposals, specifications, or working with them in obtaining a consultant or contractor. Land development basically deals with the planning commission and ultimately the board of commissioners for approval or denial. We provide the technical reviews on those plans based on the subdivision land development ordinance, stormwater management ordinance, zoning ordinance. Again, we meet with the builders. Technical reviews are done by our consultants and staff. <coughs> These are pass-through costs managed by our finance department. Capital projects. What kinds of capital projects do we work on? Many. Uh, so we will take a project from its inception. We'll create a request for proposal for design, create the scope of work, uh, the engineering, the bidding documents, administer the contract, inspect it, and close it out. Uh, this is actually one where we spend a lot of time, quite a bit. Uh oh, my <coughs> video isn't going, but that's okay. My rain cloud stopped, stopped raining. But uh, so. We meet with a lot of residents. I try to meet with them after work in the evenings because not everybody can take off work to talk about a problem they have. Uh, this may be the very, the genesis of a future capital project. You know, I would bring that to the assistant manager and manager and that may make its way up. Keep going, Steve. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, just the rain clouds, it's, it's just too important. <laughs> 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 I know my video. <laughs> it's been playing all day too. Oh come on! This <laughs> is just not meant to be today. System Sunday. I always have it on here if you really want to see it. Uh, so uh, that could be the very beginning, the genesis of a project, and we can come up with conceptual cost estimates, prepare those RFPs, meet with the manager and assistant manager, and commissioners once it moves up a level and if so directed that becomes a project everyone is downhill from someone else so people say you know I I get stormwater from this person I don't have any stormwater everybody provides runoff to someone right Radnor does to other municipalities or residents do to other residents it's not nobody's doing anything wrong it's just the topography so the types of projects, we work on all sorts of projects, pedestrian projects, traffic signals, sanitary sewer, storm sewer, culverts, big ones, stormwater management, flood reduction, streetscapes, infrastructure, again, that 24 seven emergency response. This is the North Wayne Field Basin. This was completed earlier this year. Picture on the right is the completed project. Uh, on the left down below is our one of our two hydrodynamic separators. We're very proud of them. Not that anybody else is, but we are sure <laughs> proud of them. Uh, okay. Wayne 
business over the wing business overlay district tree planting and paving project that project uh, was completed 17 days ahead of schedule it's actually it's done except for the punch list requirements that was something the board wanted to make sure it got done this fall not only did it get done it got done early uh, I have to thank the Wayne Business Association for putting up with us but I also you'll see a slide later where I'm going to make some other thanks uh, and of course that video works uh, Matching Ford Road pedestrian bridge that was something new for us because that really involved a lot of different technology and air monitoring and the paint removal and this is what I was talking about so we work with all the departments right so if you have a project we're going to work with you if they have a problem it's not always a project and we do that with our residents a lot of people just come in we try to meet with them and work on their problems it's not always a big project but we do a lot of it uh, our township administration fosters a culture of collaboration amongst all our departments and we all assist each other and that just as an example the Wayne Business Association project uh, we rely heavily on the police department the parking authority our public information officer our chief uh, the public works did the signs it was really they really helped us out a lot and we work that way all the time there's not a lot of silos here right and that starts at the top and comes down and we are very proud and honored to serve the residents of the township and the Board of Commissioners so we thank you very much like I say that's high level you'll see lists of other things later on tonight that uh, we brought for it. Thank you very much, Steve. We appreciate it and all the work that I think next we have our police. Welcome, Superintendent Flanagan. Commissioners, residents, Mr. White, Mr. Zinkowski, a uh, pleasure to make our presentation of our 2024 services of the Radnor Police Department. Our, our main complement is 43 officers, one superintendent. You can see the breakdown. We also have three civilian employees, how they're um, placed in the department. The backbone of any police department is the patrol division. In 2018, we had 13,230 <coughs> incidents which were handled. Um, 2,644 of those were crime related and 965 of them were part one crimes. Part one crimes mean some type of assault, misdemeanor or above, so more of a serious incident in nature. Um, we conduct vacant house checks, which is a very important service to the community. And we did, as of today's date, we did 1,150 vacant house checks for the community. School visits, I'm gonna take a little bit of time. As you know, in the country, there's nothing more uh, prevalent than protecting our school children. And we take that matter extremely seriously here. Uh, under the leadership of the manager, we sent two officers to two different schools for what we call hardening the target, making buildings safer. They actually did an assessment here in the building. Our daily patrol officers are requested to um, go and visit every public and private school as much as possible. Um, this, the number of 316 checks and 218 does not include police response or the details where we're there every day assisting the schools getting in and out. But they walk through the schools, they meet the children, and they get themselves familiar with the students and the building layout itself. Um, we also do bank and financial checks. We have an old school book that we sign in our banks when officers are available in their beats. They will go and uh, respond to a bank and take a walk through. Um, one of the old school type policing in our business districts, wherever they're located, officers will walk in the nighttime. Um, usually sometime after the evening hours, we'll check doors, make sure that stores are locked. If there's an inadvertent, um, somebody left the door open, which is frequent, we have a very good relationship with our business community and obviously it reduces burglaries by seeing officers out on foot. Sort of a new uh, thing, you've heard a lot about it. Uh, Mr. Zinkowski was in the car next to me when we responded to water rescue. It's sort of something the police have had to get involved in. This is actually Brimar Avenue, where flash flooding uh, took over those vehicles. We were able to respond out. The Radnor Fire Company came down and rescued the person in that uh, BMW. But we've added two uh, life vests, life ring, and a throw bag uh, to all our police cars. So every police car has the ability uh, to try and rescue somebody if, if required. Um, 
we are about the community here, the people sitting here. This is our main philosophy. This is what drives our police department. Um, I think this picture sums it up. That, that's the way we want to be noticed in our community. We do a lot of victim follow-ups. In other words, if something happens, we try and follow up with you, obviously, after the incident to see how you're doing, make sure you're doing okay. And we do a ton of community contacts. And with the activities that the township has and the events in Wayne and other places and the parades in Garrett Hill, we see a lot of people, and this is very important. We have two explosive detecting dogs. That means they find bombs. They help protect our community. They can also do searches tracks and they're also hired out um, if somebody wants to have a private one done such as Villanova University they'll check for bombs as well as all of our main events. Our emergency operations center something very valuable something Mr. Zinkowski really put into play it's a multi-function multi-hazard approach to emergency management this is where all the stakeholders from the township as Steve Norsini said we all come in and we manage incidents in this day and age um, the EMC has a significant amount of training that emergency manager really has to do a lot of training. Currently, Sergeant Chris Gluck uh, is our EMC manager, and he is going through the different training steps to learn. We manage things like the NCA championship, uh, natural disasters, our storms, and our hurricane, and we'll be coming before the commissioners. I'm excited about a Knox Box program that we're working on with the codes department that will help uh, decrease delays in service for emergencies, whatever they may be. Um, integrity control is a sergeant's position where they handle um, any incidents where somebody's not happy or conduct of a police officer, they report directly to the superintendent of police and the township manager. They also manage our random drug and alcohol testing program, which the police department is required to go through. Um, and the integrity control office, one of the assignments I gave them for 2020 is to create a de-escalation training program to help reduce negative conflicts uh, when we're out responding on calls. Our highway patrol unit conducts our traffic and engineering studies, fatal crash investigations. They also uh, inspect commercial vehicles. Um, they have a motorcycle patrol and they manage our DUI enforcement, our grants. The traffic safety component of the highway patrol unit is very important. It's a, money inter a monthly interdepartmental staff meeting where community members come to really discuss issues that are very, very important to them. And we get a lot of positive feedback. Every stakeholder, public works, engineering, parking, road crew, everybody meets and it really is good. And I'll let you read the other ones that they also <coughs> handle. The Detective Bureau handles our serious investigations, just like the Wild Wild Homicide. It's intensive work. The, you know, the most serious cases go to these guys. And they handle background investigations. They're the liaison with the district attorney's office. We're doing a ton of phones, cyber forensics, lots of phones and computers. That is what we do a lot of. And we also have to do um, court um, ordered expungements, which takes a lot of time. Um, they catalog evidence, obviously collect evidence, and they have to transport that evidence um, to different locations, including Harrisburg after our Lima lab st uh, stopped serving us. The parking authority um, has over a thousand, just under a thousand spaces that we monitor. Um, they also enforce two hour permit parking through the township. Uh, there's a lot of secondary stuff, I'll just keep moving, but they do a lot of work for us. They also have 44 kiosks that are collected two times a week. We work directly with the finance department a lot during that, and as you know, we bought state-of-the-art kiosks to make the payment as easy as possible. Another kind of hidden work that uh, falls under the parking supervisor, Bill Gallagher, is our Radnor crossing guards. There's nine crossing guards um, who cover our streets for our school children going back and forth. Um, if one of those people are sick or has a doctor's appointment, then the parking staff backs them up and the Radnor School District pays for half the cost of our crossing guards here in the township. This is a big one, animal control services. Um, processing deer complaints of the deer culling is a major undertaking. Bill Gallagher and Lieutenant Joe Pino handle that. We also handle dog complaints. We have a lot of dog bites. They work with the Board of Health and also they will handle removal of dangerous animals. So this is a very active position. Um, we handle our own community crime and police alert, alerts. We also work with a new PIO officer to get information out about our services and the positive side of policing. But there is a lot of work that goes in on a daily basis for your crime alerts. The police administration, um, I'll just be real quick, they handle our right to know requests, our payroll, our budgeting process. We manage our new burglar alarm, which uh, is really a great tribute to our staff in the township. Um, it's lessened the impact of burglar alarm enforcement uh, on the citizens of Radnor. And extra duty details, which people are hiring the police a lot for different, um, different events. Our drug task force, these aren't different officers. These are officers assigned to the department. They go out on very dangerous work. They um, 
attempt to curb at drug sales and keep them away from our families here in the township. We were able to seize two vehicles in 2019. There was 19 main cases that the DTF unit handled. Um, 16 resulted in felony arrests. And uh, our responses this year are 78 for narcotics incidents uh, this year for the township. SWAT, we have five SWAT members who, um, their part-time assignment, they go to SWAT. We share resources with a central county team, which means, for example, when we brought them in for the Wawa homicide, there's no charge to Radnor Township. So it's a very cost-effective program and gives us state-of-the-art training for our officers who can assist us. The Radnor Citizens Police Organization, this is a feather in our cap. Our volunteers are second to none. Um, we have a new class plan for the Citizens Police Academy, which is the funneling tool to a town watch and CERT. So in 2020, we will have that, and it's led by Jeff Stacy and our community team. They're out all the time doing all kinds of things. They just did all the parking for the pumpkin patch for Tammy Cohen's event, and they just did a great job. Our police chaplain program is getting a lot of recognition from our community. These volunteer police chaplains, multi-denominational, come out and assist during the worst times. When you're told somebody's passed and there's a tragedy going on, these people are able to come out and assist us. And not only do they assist those who are grieving and negative times, but they also ride with the police officers to make sure that their mental health and stability is well. So we're very proud of our volunteer police chaplain program. Rider Police has a 2020 staffing proposal and request. We're asking the town to consider placing eight officers for the township. This would include one additional office, one additional sergeant, and seven patrol officers. We believe that this will enhance the services to Radnor Township. Um, we'll increase, by increasing by eight, it will increase the patrol division by four officers, and it will create a new specialized unit within the department. Adding four officers to the patrol division will allow the creation of two new high-density sectors. These new sectors will provide visibility in the township's business and school corridor. The, this will allow faster and more effective response time, and as you know, we're competing in the active shooters where these incidents are over and their mass killings occur within six to eight minutes. We want to be able to get in there before that six to eight minutes transpires, and that's from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Here's a ward map of the township. That is our four sectors. So right now there's area cars that fill in those four sectors. If we're able to increase our staffing, you see this high density beats, one and two. And I'll show you what, it, we would not be taking away from anything, we would be enhancing the coverage. As you can see, these are our high volume areas. Right now, if sector three has to go back up somebody, that leaves that whole sector undone. This would allow more coverage of the, the routine sectors and have the high density where our crashes and other things are be available. The proposed hybrid unit would be a multifunctional unit. The sergeant would be our emergency operations coordinator, which is a lot of work going into that. Uh, one officer would specialize as a narcotics officer, one officer as a school resource officer, and one officer as a school and building safety evaluation officer. These officers and sergeant would also be available if we have a sudden crime trend. So if we get, we had a wave of car break-ins or car thefts, these officers now are not attached to a platoon. They could float, float and be reassigned to handle those particular assignments. I'd like to thank the men and women of the Radnor Police Department for their professionalism and dedicated service. Thank you. Lieutenant Dietrich is in the back. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for everything you guys do. To serve us. Um, public works? Steve McNellis' absence. Uh, Mike volunteered for this position. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Mike does a great really job. In. Thank you so much, boss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Mike Simmons. I'm supervisor of the highway division and sewer division and uh, parks, and I work under Steve McNeilis. Steve is a little under the weather. He had some surgery, but he's recovering. He'll be back soon. Him and I have been friends for over 30 years and worked together here for over 30 years. Uh, tonight, I'll, I'd like to talk about something I love, and that's Radnor Township. I've spent my life and uh, bought my home to work at this place and raised my children to work in here. I get emotional about it because I honestly care for my heart about this place and what it's done for me and my family and for the men I work with. Yeah. Our mission, our mission has always been anything a resident needs, like an extra thing, go that extra mile. You know, I, every day we get calls about maybe I'm late putting my trash out or I need a hand getting something out, or could you come look at the erosion from the rain? You know, all it takes is an extra five minutes to be kind and, and work with people and try to help them with each job we touch and get involved in. And I think that's what separates us from the people, the other townships and services around us is that we go the extra mile. Our guys, I mean, I get calls every week and emails from residents that want to know the name of their trash men just to thank them. And, and that's important to have that rapport. That's what makes Radnor special. These are the different divisions within the department over at the Public Works. Teamwork, it is really a, a valuable item for us. Just putting this PowerPoint together was teamwork. Steve and his daughter <laughs> did the initial. Leah, who everybody speaks to on the phone probably whenever they call the garage, she's our backbone her and I looked at it and then Sunday my lovely wife and I spent three hours <laughs> finishing it up so it does take key work in the public works and these are some of the areas that we try to work and, and try to do excellent work within these divisions every day each division handles not only their own jobs but the jobs they may have to cross over and help with this sewer department or the parks or the, or the refuge. Uh, these are my refuge guys here. Our, the refuge has not dropped even with recycling, how recycling has kind of grown over the years. We still get the same amount of trash and any given Monday, Tuesday, and these guys do all that along with <coughs> the, bless you, open stops. We will provide a service for a small fee you can uh, have up to five items for fifty dollars we'll come to your house sometimes we'll even if you can't get it down we'll come up and we'll carry your refrigerator out for you well you know that's part of the, the rear and then we have rear yard service which is about a little under 800 homes we provide we have a separate vehicle that actually does a lot of the back ends to try to keep up the pace because really on some the trash truck can't get in some of the driveways so it, it really helps the resident and it also helps us by having uh, we have a pickup that we have one guy that does this the narrow driveways and you know some driveways are a half a mile so he, he does that area for him and keeps the flow going on a daily basis the highway division that's my department where I spent my my first 30 years uh, we do everything from uh, the blacktop the plowing the, the speed hump installation they're all part of the work that we do leak collection and composting that's one of our big things we started today was our our 2019 season of, of running around chasing leak piles trying to keep the roads clean and actually it's important especially this time of year this weekend was a perfect example I ended up here on Sunday with a couple of guys because everything's washing down the gutter lines and you got to try to keep the drains open so our leak collection and, and staying on top of it from you know it's say oh why do you start early you start you know for, uh, the first the 28th you have to get them off the road because you know you get blocked in let it's and you end up with a lot of flooding and people have problems with drainage in their yard and and we, we try to stay on top of that as much as we can <coughs> one of our main duties in the highway division is inlet clean out we spend countless days from anytime once the 
January, February starts, where you don't have a snow time, we'll actually go out and open up a storm drain and clean them out. One of it is we have to follow the guidelines that the state of Pennsylvania provides for material that's in your storm drains. We have to keep it clear and we have to calculate everything we, we take out. I, these guys do all the clean outs. They tell, they write down any of the inlets that need repairs that may end up being, as we all see sinkages sometime along the road, whatever, that all can happen. But if you replace one brick, you're, you're, you know, before it becomes a major problem, you got it. And then we calculate all material and, and then keep data of, all, of each year. I think this year we were up to, we cleared like 34 tons of debris out of inlets. And that's compared to the old days when we use anti-skid, it's a lot better, but it's still something we stay on top of. And, the, and it's one of the services the residents really like is they know that their pipes and their, uh, under their property that go into our creeks and stuff are clear. We jet the lines with the help of the sewer department. We, we uh, inspect every inlet. Sign department, those guys cover so much ground. Constantly there's either a sign knocked down, new signs going up, there's constant painting. Throughout the summer months they'll come in probably three days a week at three in the morning to, to start painting. That way they can beat the traffic and sometimes the heat and then they'll, they'll, they do that. They handle all the, like if they see a light out or whatever, we call it into Higgins if we can't do what ourselves, our outside company. Bill and his guys clear signs throughout their summer months. They'll go around along with the help of the trash department, which one of the jobs I've added to those guys is they go around and they clear signage and they help the, the those guys with keeping uh, the signs clear. You can see the stop signs, the speed signs. It's simple things like that. The trash guys, they do all the islands now. Since I've taken over, I got my guys, they love to feel like they're part of the big picture of the trash guys. At one time, they were just the trash department at Radnor that you guys probably know years ago used to go home early. And that was part of their deal and they weren't part of the big picture. Well, they are now. They, they handle all the islands. You'll see guys out there in the middle of a Wednesday afternoon with a weed whacker and a blower on Route 30. That'll be my trash guys because they're done with their doing and they don't mind it because they actually want to be, they feel like they're part of the unit and they're not just a separate entity. We're all part of it. So those guys are out doing that work. Parks department, there's 12 gentlemen that work in that apartment. They handle everything from cutting all of our fields doing all this, the islands along 30, the, the small islands like Brookside. And we have one gentleman that is our head weeder and does everything. If you ever see Jose out there, <laughs> it, he's, he's out there eight, eight hours a day just going about his business, trying to keep up with the weeds. And we try to maintain good flower beds and, and keep it beautiful and wane. And we've gotten back to something I love is gotten rid of a lot of those red rocks and improve back to mulching and and we're trying to make it you know prettier again up in Wayne they've done some beautiful work up there so it's, <coughs> that's nice you know we're, we're not just looking to make it easy but we're, ma we're making it pretty again and, and more beautiful for the residents they take care of uh, the fields they do two times a year we do our fertilization program early spring early fall we try to stay on top the object with the weeds is has always been if you use organic fertilizers is to get down as much fertilizer good fertilizer and seeding and you, you conquer the weeds by overtaking the weeds because you know we don't use pesticides here which is a great thing we, we try to do it not natural and uh, you know we maybe a field isn't perfect all the time with there may be a weed or two but at least it's green and we're trying our best to come up with new technologies and new ways of doing it. Ricky Foster, one of the field leaders, has been working with some other uh, townships and has really been going out and branching out and trying to get, just, you know, beat people's ears and see what they can come up with, to come up with some new ideas on how to, to make our fields look even better. Uh, the baseball diamonds are, are an important thing for our Little League, that we do them a couple of times a week. We also do root maintenance at the beginning of each season, beginning and end. 
we are actually now looking at different types of surfaces to try to soils to mix in to improve our baseball fields. We have talked to people from even the Phillies and and other organiza and baseball organizations and colleges to try to get some different philosophies on how to make our fields look even better. And it's one of the things that we're really proud of is our ball fields really look good for our little leagues. Another area of the parks has really taken over and it's been a big uh, help in the last couple of years is storm damage. We go into a lot of culverts, we pick out trees and, and large limbs and stuff that has fallen into culverts where at one time we did probably weren't as good on it as we are now. We, we see stuff, we go out there, we get it cleared out. It, it may take us a week sometimes, but we'll, we'll get large trees and, and remove from there and keep our streams and beds open. Our sewer department is a three-man crew. They're, they're on call 24-7. Those guys will take calls for stoppages or other issues. They try to do as much routine maintenance, so that means flushing out lines and, and up and around Wayne in areas where our restaurants are and down in uh, Bryn Mawr where the other restaurants are and other communities to keep up on the grease and the lines and, and this routine maintenance. And they also are the support unit for our stormwater. When the highway has a stormwater problem with a block pipe or whatever, they come out and jet the line and work with us. And they work alongside the highway guys when we get new cons new roads put in, we replace manholes that are like, you can't even open the lids. So they'll work with the highway guys replacing. This year alone, I, I think we did 35 manholes, which is actually a lot when it comes to it. We try to improve for if there's a stoppage in the middle of the night, you can get a lid open. Uh, now this is our mechanic group. These three gentlemen work on everything from a trash truck to a weed whacker. They do it all. Uh, they, they have taken on projects this last year. We had a street sweeper that needed probably $25,000 of work because of the welding and all. They bought scrap metal, worked tirelessly, stayed late a few days, and probably saved us half the money doing it themselves and figuring out how to pinpoint the, the bolt holes even by welding and stuff to save the township money. And Matt Pilati, who's a young guy, took over this division a few years ago and, it, and, and it's running better than it ever has. Facilities, we do a lot of the buildings here along with here, we do a lot of the minor stuff. We do the light bulbs, we check if there's a spill, you know, we come and clean up after a, like a spill or, or water damage. We also, one of Steve's big deals is he has to handle any contractors that come in if we have a roof leak or another uh, other issue, and we maintain the property around our facilities. We do the sidewalks, the curbs, the flower beds. We try to help out with all that and keep, keep them up and improve them. And we're constantly working on the buildings. As you know, this building's 10 years old now. We start needing work, and we try to stay on top of it. One of the things we've done at the Public Works that I've been most proud of is that we don't waste money. We do stuff, we do it with the object of what needs done. Any project we take on, we look at it as though it's our own. We don't we don't blow money, we try to do, do it within budget, and we try to do it in a cost-effective way by doing as much work in-house as we can. And that's something that we have really improved in the last five years. When Steve came over from the, he became our director, that's one of the things he brought with him, is that idea that we can do more of it ourselves and try to be more self-sufficient, so I can thank him for that. Emergency response, I had talked about it. We're there, like the snow, the guys, you know, they'll they'll say, hey, if I'm available anytime you need me tonight. I hear it's gonna snow, you know, down trees, we're in, any, any storm, and we're there for it. We do whatever we can to help out. We put generators out in rain, we put barricades out for the police. If there's a uh, there's down wires, we, we work a sanitary sewer. Uh, they'll go out and do if you have call up and say you might you have a blockage before you call a plumber. We'll actually go out to your house and look at your trap and see if there's something we can do to save you money as a resident. So and that's one of the 
the things that I'm most proud of with my guys is, is that I, I can call somebody at any time, any time in the night, and they'll be here. Budget request. One of the things that we're looking at is that it takes 22 guys to do trash and recycling, two, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. We have 20 guys. Every day I take from the track, the parks department, or the highway, at least one to two guys, that's if nobody calls out. And it doesn't sound like a lot, it is, but if you have six guys in the highway and you're doing 300 foot of curb and you have nobody to shovel, or you need somebody to flag for you for 15 minutes on the corner of Newtown and, and Abrams Lane, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff that, I mean, having an extra guy would really help us in a lot of cases you know, the parks department, you know, like I said, Jose's out there by himself, and it's overwhelming sometimes. And, you know, so there's something, there's never anything wrong with some fresh blood to once in a while. A new person coming in brings, you know, we've gotten some new kids in the last couple of years to fill some of the vacancies we have had. And it's nice having some fresh faces and some new perspective from some younger guys. And one of the, the vacancy, but then the, the supervisor role is Steve, it's Steve and I upstairs. Steve handles the building maintenance. He handles the trees, the overwhelming amount of trees that we go out and check to see if they're within the right of way for you know, the ash tree bore and the other problems we've had with the, with, you know, over the years with insects in the last couple of years with our trees and stuff like that. He handles all the budgetary stuff, the PO stuff. You know, he works on that stuff. I handle the men. I handle the, the flow of men and I try to handle the work of the highway division and then I also try to oversee the trash division and like right now it, it's just me and it's, it's really hard for the parks division especially and to have not have a leader to be a supervisor within that just somebody else that could take charge of some of the men and help us with the daily motions of going through Get, keeping us organized, keeping us, you know, in, in order. I can't go out and be everywhere on every job to see it, but I try with the highway guys, especially because a lot of times there's a project they may need an extra set of eyes. I call Steve Narcini, it backs us up when, I, when we have a question, but it really would be nice to have another supervisor. Steve and I could really use the help. These are a couple of additional things that we that, that have been talked about and brought to our attention that you guys had asked about numbers on if we were to have a, a tree crew. We don't have our own dedicated tree tr crew for down trees or, or, or heavy pruning, and that's something you guys wanted to talk about. And the other side was also the sewer crew. If we want to take on, the, you know, nobody understands a sewer issue until a pipe's bad on King of Pressure Road. Or, or another spot along there where you don't see. A lot of our stuff is terracotta still, it's old. We need updating, we need more maintenance, and an additional sewer crew would probably help with that. And we have to realize in the long run with our sewer system that we have to start putting money into it. it should, I, don't, I don't think just reacting to something all the time is, is a smart decision. Thank you guys. I hope it didn't drag it on too long, but yeah. I'm just Even though it's a Christmas card, you stop by with donuts, you guys pop in once in a while. That's all the guys really want is to know. And they, you guys have done a great job. This board has done an especially good job of saying thank you to us and we appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mike. We'll let Steve know you did a good job. You did thank a you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'll have a call tonight. Yeah, tell him we hope he feels better. Uh, he's getting there. Hey, Tammy, how are you? Hi, good evening, everyone. Good job. If there's one presentation that's going to crash the system, it will be mine because there's a lot of pictures in it.
thanks again uh, for the opportunity to be here. My name is Tammy Cohen. I'm the Director of Recreation. Um, I've been pleased to be in my role since 1999. Um, I've enjoyed every minute working for the township. Uh, our department is small, it consists of four individuals that you see here. Uh, myself, our Recreation uh, Program Supervisor, Heather DeCanzio, uh, our Program Coordinator, Tracy Crew, and our Recreation assist Assistant, uh, Lizette Subach. Uh, we have a great group. Uh, we do a lot. But of course, we can't achieve the things that we do on a regular basis without interacting with a lot of different groups throughout the township, namely the Board of Commissioners, the Parks and Recreation Board, uh, of course, uh, our 100 plus uh, contract and service providers and staff members, uh, and namely the residents. Uh, we have contact with the res residents on a daily basis, uh, and they help us make the decisions we do to do the things that we do and the services that we provide. Uh, Radnor is really fortunate. Uh, we're a community that has something for everyone. So no, no matter what you value in terms of recreation, passive or active, uh, Radnor is really lucky in terms of its re recreational programming and of course its facilities. These aren't stock photos. These are real photos that we've actually taken uh, out in the parks and out at different events. Um, there are actually eight core areas where we spend our time as a department. The two uh, largest and most critical are the programming in the community events, of course, and the parks and facilities. The parks and facilities uh, has a lot of overlap in terms of what we do with the parks <coughs> department, as we heard a little bit about earlier, uh, with our department managing the scheduling, the operational components of the, of the projects, of the, uh, the parks, and the park projects um, in terms of their development. In terms of recreational programming, uh, we deliver about 100, 100 or so programs throughout the course of a year uh, that happen uh, during the four <coughs> seasons. We have about 3,000 people who participate annually. Uh, we take a community-driven approach. Uh, we try to focus on the interests of our residents and the things that they're looking for. We have a lot of conversations with them to understand what they're looking for. We know there's a lot of other services that are provided here in the busy mainline area. We try to complement and, of course, not take over what a lot of those things are that are already being done. Uh, we have excursions we do annually that sell out, the US, uh, US Open Tennis Championships and the New York City trip. We have discount des uh, destination ticket program uh, to places like ski resorts um, and amusement parks. It's very popular. We have a lot of positive health and wellness initiatives and, of course, our programs. Looking at our programs, we have a lot of new favorites like pickleball. It's grown amazingly uh, in terms of interest over the last several years, not only here in Radnor, but nationally. Uh, we have a skateboarding clinic that has been growing enthusiastically for the last couple of years. Um, we also have a wizarding program. Uh, it's actually been going on for about 11 years, so it's more of a tradition for us, uh, now being run directly by our department, by Heather and Tracy. And then Radnor Day Camp. Radnor Day Camp, believe it or not, has been running for 78 years straight. Uh, it's an amazing program, offers swimming, creative arts, dance, uh, field trips, lots of different things that happen. Um, it's a great place for folks to, to come over the summer. And over 65% of our staff are connected to Radnor in some way, either graduated from Radnor High School or actually live here in the township. Uh, this is what our parents tell us. I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, we've been fortunate over the last several years through surveys and through uh, formal information and fact-finding with our, with our parents that um, over 90% of what the feedback is that we're receiving is ranked as either good or excellent, so we know they're having a positive experience, which is terrific. Uh, we've had some changes over the last uh, decade um, in terms of meeting the needs, the developmental needs of a lot of the participants within day camp. Um, just since 15 alone, we've seen the number of special needs campers double uh, from 15 to about 29 campers. Uh, in terms of campers that are requiring one-on-one -on -one needs attention and group-based attention. Um, so it's, some, it's an area where we've been forced to focus a lot of our attention in terms of the behavioral, social, and emotional needs of our, of our children. Uh, we work closely with the Radnor Committee for special, special Education. Consequently, we run special needs programming over the course of a year that's been widely popular um, and is focus, focused specifically on children with special needs. Switching gears to community events, in the last 10 years, community events have been um, a real backbone for our department. It's been a major growth area. Um, we've, we've grown from just a few events over the course of the, of the year to about 18, <coughs> about 15,000 people. We dub are participating annually. It's an opportunity for people <coughs> to get out and spend time with their neighbors, 
spend time with their families, um, away from the hustle and bustle of life. They get a chance to spend time in our parks and spend time uh, in a lot of other recreational facilities and um, facilities here in Radnor Township. Um, all of the direct costs are supported by a sponsorship program that we have in place. Um, and of course, we couldn't do all of these events successfully without the help of all of our different departments, namely our public works department and our police department. Uh, just to take a look at what the population has, what the population attendance looks like um, with regards to programming and special events. Um, as I mentioned, special events have been a major growth area. We've seen about 80% growth alone just since 2010. I mentioned the popularity of the, um, or I should say the, the need and the, the support of the staff taking part within our community events. They also have a good time at the events too, and it gets a, gets a chance to get them out amongst the residents, not only doing their job, but having a positive interaction as well and they have a lot of fun with it. Uh, about 10 years ago, we worked with a couple of uh, community partners. Um, a lot of you in this room, I think, have probably heard from me in many different ways um, in terms of working together, either attending an event or running a a, an event together. We've worked in collaboration. Um, now we're working with, with well over 30 of our organizations um, in some way, um, and it helps really get them out there in the community too and showcases a lot of their services and the things that they're providing. Uh, the Fall Harvest is one of our biggest events we do throughout the course of the year. You can see the parking down there in the left-hand corner. That was all done by the Radnor, Radnor Citizens Police Academy. I think somebody had mentioned it earlier. Chris, Chris had mentioned it earlier, the support that they provide. Um, they've been integral to making sure that our events happen in a safe way as well. Um, this is an event that's been going on for many years. Wheels of Wayne and another very popular one, Spring Extravaganza. These are all events that are attended by thousands. We also have some, some smaller events that appeal to more specialized and smaller populations like our daddy-daughter event. Annually it sells out in about two hours. Um, same way with the mother-daughter princess tea party which is coming up in a few weeks. Um, sold out in one day. Mother-son superhero challenge was another new one sold out very quickly. Santa's delivery, another annual favorite. Um, it's one event where we get to partner with all the fire companies, which is fantastic. We get to work with them on the evening. They get to go out into the neighborhoods. And uh, we've seen that, uh, that particular program almost triple um, in the last seven years that it's been around. And it's one program, I will say, in my entire tenure that we've received the most positive feedback. And it's really an intense collaboration of all of the different staff working together. We get a lot of folks that volunteer the night um, from all the different departments. Um, the Umland Tunnel statue dedication really cast the national spotlight on Radnor Township. Um, when we take a look at our community events and how we compare to a lot of our, our neighbors, you can see we definitely are overwhelming in terms of how many we have to offer over the course of a year um, for our residents. And it just really shows that hunger and that demand that they have in, in enjoying those events. So. I don't know that we'll keep them growing, but we'll definitely <coughs> maintain at least where we are. Uh, we've also been the recipient of a couple of different awards in the last several years for our um, for our events that obviously cast Radnor Township in a positive uh, spotlight, uh, particularly in the Radnor Town and the um, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Pennsylvania Recreation and Park Society um, and the National Recreation and Parks Association. So really, what happens each day? So each day, folks are, are focused on the nuts and the bolts of putting the programs together. It takes um, a lot of detail, a lot of facility coordination. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, we also have to sell it. We have to build our recreation system so we can have registration electronically. There's a lot of time that goes into that. Um, we also serve as a, an informational hub. A lot of people think that we run all of the community sports organizations. They still think we run the pool. They still think we run Radnor High School tennis court. So we get a lot of phone calls and a lot of information, folks looking for um, not just the things that we deliver, but other things that are going on in the community. One of the other ways that sets us apart is we have a strategic plan for how we go about putting our programming together in our community events. Um, we're focused on quality control. Um, we wanna make sure that the residents are having a good experience. Um, we wanna make sure that we understand what their values are and their interests are so that we're constantly evolving to meet those needs. We're focused on programming that stimulates <coughs> physical, social, emotional, developmental benefits. We recognize that recreation really has a lot of superhero benefits. So we try to make sure that our folks gain those and derive those from the programming. And those are things that we focus on. 
Um, our leadership, um, a lot of times with our contracted vendors, we can't be the leadership. They're the leadership, so we have to make sure that they're trained appropriately. They're meeting strict insurance guidelines. There's a lot of new insurance guidelines with regards to abuse and molestation that exist today. They're things that we're focused on, and we hold a high standard to make sure it's being achieved and training for all of our staff. We always evaluate the what-if scenarios. We work really closely with the police department to make sure we understand if there's an emergency that happens at a program or an event, how are we going to respond? How are we going to communicate? We make sure all of those things are kind of played out in our heads and um, strategically that way we can ensure we're moving in the right direction. In 2020, there's no operating budget requests that are being asked by, by the recreation department. Switching gears to parks and facilities, we play a big role in overseeing uh, the different components of the parks. Um, Mr. Simmons went into uh, a lot of the detail about the parks, the acreage, um, so this is a little bit more of a breakdown of that. Um, of course, the Radnor Trail System, the Radnor Skate Park, and then Radnor Activity Center and Sulpizio Gymnasium, which our department serves at the forefront of the operations there, the usability there, and a lot of the projects that take place at that facility. Parks in general, this is just a breakdown locally, how Radnor Township compares to its neighbors in terms of the amount of parks. I thought this was telling to include this just to show you, you know, Radnor really does rank pretty high in terms of the amount of parks that it has compared to the neighbors. Nationally, um, the National <coughs> uh, Recreation Parks Association um, statistically states that there's, in general, across our nation, one park for every 2,266 residents. Radnor Township has one park for every 1,391 residents. And that's when you look at our parks that are publicly accessible, not places right now like our Dawson Fifthwood Park and West Wayne Preserve, which aren't publicly accessible at this time. Um, as I mentioned, the scheduling uh, is something that we're at the forefront of. We're a hub for all the community sports organizations and other users of the fields and the, the athletic fields and the spaces. Um, we try to you know balance that so that the usage can exist for structured and unstructured usage, so that's something that we put a lot of time and effort into. There's about 20,000 hours that are um, formally used on an annual basis, and we work with over, over 75 user groups, and there's an array of different things that we're coordinating, as you see there. Um, we have higher standards of responsibility in terms of our parks. The safety and the maintenance are critical. Um, in, in trying to coordinate specific projects that make sure that there are safe features in our park, so that things are being upgraded, things are being updated, rusty fences are being fixed, things like that. We work closely with uh, the Parks and Recreation Board, the Board of Commissioners, to identify capital funding, public-private partnerships, so that we can get these facilities and make sure they're always in top-notch condition. Um, several years ago, we worked to fund um, at the leadership of the board uh, through uh, two bonds to be able to start addressing a lot of those um, infrastructure and safety related issues through a lot of these projects that are listed here and some others that have already been completed. But looking ahead into 2020, um, when you take a look at the budget, there will be a number of things included, bless you, in there um, in terms of capital projects. Those capital projects are um, in there to address aging infrastructure and deterioration. They're park system wide, um, and there's nothing new. We're not looking to add anything new. We're looking to fix existing things, which I'll show you here. The Radnor Trail in particular, there's significant deterioration that's occurring um, on the abutments to the area along the trails. Uh, along the trail, you can see some of the differences here. This is what the trail used to look like. That's what the trail looks like today. We have matting that's exposed in a certain area of changes in elevations. That's all. A detail that we're going to have to look at very soon in terms of fixing. Um, Dittmar Park, significant walking path repairs. and Tunnel, significant walking path repairs. Callan Park, this is what our parking lot looks like at Callan Park. Um, I know that this is a project that might be um, looked at in terms of a stormwater management uh, project can, uh, entailing the park in the future, but there's some immediate repairs that are going to be needed there. Um, Harford Park, um, there's also some issues at Harford Park with regards to the entrance drive, and there's a, an area here where everybody seems to drive off the grass that I, I think we're going to have to put some focus and attention to to make sure that gets fixed. Um, Emlyn Tunnel Park, um, once we complete this, the comfort station installation there, that'll be happening before spring 2020. Uh, we're probably going to have even greater uh, parking lot and driveway, driveway repairs that are needed there. Odorisio Park is another one. 
Um, we have a lot of spaces within there that are significantly deteriorated um, and lots of repairs that are needed. Um, Mike had touched a little bit on the ball fields. Um, the ball fields are great in terms of the way they're being treated um, and you know cared for, but we have some significant issues and changes of, in elevations at uh, three of all our ballparks, Anki Park, Warren Phillip Home Park, and Bo Connor Park. We have some areas where you could be playing third base, and if you had to run off into the foul territory, you're going to drop off at about a foot, um, which is very unsafe. So these are things you're going to see in the budget, too, um, that need to be addressed. Um, Odorisio Park, um, we've had requests um, and interest in doing a comprehensive redo to this park. Maybe not quite to the degree of Clemmer Chrome, but there are some significant features there that need to be um, evaluated. Um, these are going to be included in there. Cowan Park is another one. We have um, base repair, that's for base, rusted base <coughs> bases to these um, playground structures um, that need to be repaired. Um, this is an old playground, 26 years old, uh, needs significant. Um, up, upgrades, <coughs> possibly a new surfacing, maybe a port in place surfacing that will allow for less deterioration over time um, due to the stormwater that runs through there. Odorisio Park is another one, um, now pushing 24 years old. Um, so essentially just want to say thank you for allowing me to be able to serve. Thank you for allowing mm -hmm. us to do the things that we do in the Recreation Department and allowing our department and the township to stand out. I appreciate your time. Here within the building. 
Um, community relations um, is quite obvious. It's supporting all of our civic, civic groups. They come to me um, in any number, number of ways during the business day to promote um, all the good news they have going on and events. Um, but also, I think it's important to educate our community. So I've established um, a PSA program with the help of Ian. Um, he does all the filming and I do uh, the writing and producing. Um, and I work with each department on editorial calendars um, to push out the information that they have that they believe will be helpful to our community. Um, special project and events, that's self-explanatory, that's seasonally driven. Um, and that's also partnering with local organizations like the Mainline Chamber of Commerce, Delaware County Chamber of Commerce, et cetera, to promote the good news they have going on. Um, media relations is uh, an important bucket in the role of public information officer. It's important to have healthy relationships with our local media, a healthy um, media list, um, for two reasons. One, I want to be able to come, go to them in times of need if we have a broader message to get out to our community. <coughs> but also, I'd like to, them to look at us as thought leaders. If they have a lead or a story of interest where they need a local opinion, I'd like to be on top of their list for them to reach out to us. Um, and lastly, crisis communications. So most of my job, I. Um, requires an entrepreneurial spirit and I operate independently on workflow um, but in terms of crisis that's really the on-call 24-7 uh, piece of my job and that's when I work in close collaboration with the manager or assistant manager or superintendent of police and whatever department head um, is on uh, that particular crisis. Some goals and objectives. So the goal of the public Office of Public Information is to spread the good news of the township um, effectively communicate with the multiple audiences. Um, so I always want to be aware that we have many audiences here in our township, um, but the goal is to get one consistent message that is palatable, palatable to all. Um, the objective is to know those audiences, target messaging to those audiences, and spark community pride. Okay, so the first portion of this slide we've really covered so far, um, same with media relations. Um, though I do want to note that in building media relations, um, we've been offered the opportunity um, to have a column in the mainline media news with editor's approval to really demonstrate Radnor's voice. So that's something I look forward to participating in. Um, in terms of social media and graphics, um, the township website is such a tool for us to release information to uh, the local community, and we are about to launch a nine-month redesign that I'm particularly excited about. I will be heading up that project with support from um, the various department heads. Um, and it will be graphic in nature, but also um, content, complete overhaul of images, complete overhaul of information. <coughs> Lastly, cable programming. Um, so I've been, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Vince Shelley, um, and uh, as, an, as an independent producer for the Radnor Roundup, we've done one show, and it's a focus on local business owners. So we wanted to highlight the business community here in town and give them an opportunity to discuss what they have going on, how they establish their businesses here, um, and what it takes to be a successful business in Radnor. Um, but then we have another component. We have a studio here in our building that, um, as far as I can tell, has been underutilized. So I've been exploring ideas as to how we can get more leverage out of that space. Um, our health officer, Marie, has used it to do an interview with a local pulmonologist um, to cover the vaping epidemic. And then Ian and I together um, have produced several PSAs here um, within our building um, that we released to the uh, general population through um, social media, but also we have healthy partnerships going with the uh, Radnor School District. Um, Michael Petiti, who's the communications director over there, got wind of our content and the things we were filming, and he said there was a need based on his audience for that information, and when we shared with him. So he is now running that on um, the local, uh, his local channel, and Vince is nice enough to also promote our PSAs on his channel. <coughs> In terms of overall strategy, I think the uh, keeping close relationships for, with every department is vital. Um, there's no way I can represent uh, the messaging of this uh, municipal building if I don't actually know what's going on with each department. So that will remain a strategy. Um, mass media, same thing. Leveraging our social media platforms and our uh, website we design. Um, this includes also uh, press releases, speech writing, etc. We've covered social media strategy quite a bit, but I just want to continue to improve our reach and make sure that the, uh, the information is sent out in an accurate and timely manner and is very protocol driven. Something new is economic development. It's a passion of mine coming from the private sector, um, but I think it's important for any PIO to be able to network with the local community, business owners, and other organizations. So in the short time I've been here, it'll be um, five months in November, um, 
I've taken a leadership class at the Mainline Chamber of Commerce, thanks to the White who nominated me for that course. Um, I've joined a government affairs uh, board with uh, the Delaware County um, Chamber of Commerce, um, and I work closely uh, with the Wayne Business Association. <coughs> Lastly, I think it's important for any PIO to uh, demonstrate a total commitment and dedication to developing community relationships, including after business hours. So a lot of our business owners um, don't have time to meet during the regular business day. So being available in the morning and evenings has become quite important in this role. Okay, so this is new for me, serving um, Radnor PD as PIO. Um, my background is in the uh, private sector and it has quickly become one of um, the most exciting parts of my job. It's very different than the regular administrative duties I have here upstairs, um, serving Superintendent has been a, short, a sheer pleasure for me. It's been very exciting and he <coughs> is educational based. So any opportunity he has to really let me understand the inner workings of the police department, he brings me in on and I couldn't appreciate it more. Um, however, I operate at his discretion <coughs> at all times. Um, so if there is an event, I do not release anything until um, he has approved it and he has helped me craft the message. Um, so that's an initial responsibility, getting out a general alert with approval to Ooh. our local appropriate the media and then a secondary function it's typically <coughs> when a scene has wrapped or an event has wrapped I provide um, a detailed synopsis of what has happened and how it might impact folks going forward um, there's another component of course which is emergency notifications that would be for a larger issue that would affect our whole community um, and that is very protocol driven as well and that um, taps into mm -hmm. our website function um, lastly uh, social media and PS PSAs I work closely <coughs> with officer Brady McHale um, who's an officer here in Radnor, um, and we publicize all of the Radnor Police Department news via social media channels, YouTube, and our website. Um, together, he and I have developed an editorial calendar um, about anything going on in terms of uh, emergency services, safety, and policing that might be interesting to our local community. Recently, uh, this week, we'll be releasing um, a PSA on our K-9 program, um, which was uh, just a pleasure to film because we had the two dogs join us on camera. Um, a few weeks ago, we did the safe exchange drop that many folks um, didn't know we had and now they do. Um, and then a week ago, we did a bus safety PSA where the superintendent of police partnered with the superintendent of the school district. And I think that might be the first time they come together for a public service announcement on camera. Um, so I'm excited about that healthy partnership. Lastly, our forecast going forward. We're a brand new department. Um, I think it's important to have a vision statement. So our mission statement talks about what we do every day and how it, our work is guided. But going forward, our vision statement is to provide an effective communication system that serves the people of Radnor Township, enhances economic prosperity, and preserves the quality of our community. I also think it's um, important, um, the good work we've started here, which is timely and effective communication. Um, it gives us an opportunity to deliver open and consistent communication to our key stakeholders. Um, and I'm a one-man show right now with the help of Ian, um, who saves me many of the time because of his technical knowledge and his um, production abilities. But I think we would benefit um, going forward from one dedicated full-time employee with web video and technical expertise just to support the volume of work we have going on. Um, and that's it. I can't thank you enough for having me. Um, like Mr. Simmons said, I'm also born and raised here in Radnor, and it's a pleasure to be working for you all. seriousness I do want to thank the board for giving us uh, a little less than an hour and a half out of the whole year just to, for us to tell our story about what our folks are doing every day mm -hmm. Commissioner Borowski I appreciate your comments earlier about the pride that the folks take in what they do uh, hopefully that's coming out tonight because it's evident every single day 
um, that we get to work here and I feel very fortunate to work with these folks and the frontline folks that are out there doing it every day and I appreciate uh, the opportunity that Bob allowed me and the commissioners have allowed me to do uh, for almost 10 years now uh, and most of the time I'm talking about high-level budget stuff so it's nice to, to spend a couple minutes tonight and talk about the finance department specifically um, Every day, uh, our mission is to uh, professionally and ethically and effectively manage the township's financial resources by identifying, developing, and advancing and implementing fiscal, human resource, and administrative strategies, policies, and practices, all for the public's benefit. Um, and it's something that uh, at the end of the day, we understand we're here to serve the public. We're to safeguard the public's asset, assets. This isn't our money. This is other folks' money. Uh, and our, we take that job very seriously. Uh, our daily approach is uh, we have, uh, we're fortunate enough to have people who are um, problem solvers. Uh, they're not necessarily problem identifiers. Uh, they're the ones that when a problem identifies itself, they will jump in and help be part of the solution and come up, uh, coming up uh, and solving those problems. Um, we constantly work on trying to find better ways to do things tomorrow. We like, uh, we focus on helping our stakeholders uh, our departments, our employees, uh, and holding ourselves to a high standard. So uh, a couple of the areas uh, that we really take pride in, and the good news is, is that this graph is starting to become dated, um, that, uh, but it also helps uh, to remind us of what happens when, when we're not necessarily paying attention. Uh, the township's audit comments from uh, over a decade ago now, uh, and then the, the focus that was uh, insisted upon by the board uh, and then made clear uh, to all the employees to immediately correct uh, and we were able to do that and over the last uh, four or five years we've knocked those comments down uh, we had one for a couple years and then we implemented the software which uh, took care of that which was a fixed asset accounting uh, comment so the last two years we've had no comments so uh, we get graded every year and we take this very seriously um, and it's something that the entire staff takes seriously as well uh, in terms of high standards, the controls that we've implemented to make sure that we are doing uh, our jobs as best we can uh, with the segregation of duties, uh, we've implemented pre-purchase requisition and purchase uh, uh, workflow, three-way matching on all uh, accounts payable invoices, which I know the departments absolutely love, because uh, what it does is it makes sure that when they enter a requisition before they buy something, that that matches the invoice when it comes in, which matches uh, a packing slip or a delivery slip um, and it, we will not cut a check unless all three of those numbers match. Uh, we have also implemented electronic workflow on the, the payroll side. We have dual check siding between the administration and uh, our elected treasurer. Uh, and then we've implemented various banking best practices with uh, fraud present, prevention workflow and limiting uh, employee access to what they can do uh, with their logins. Uh, our our uh, de department is divided up into three divisions. We have an accounting division. Uh, we have an HR division and we also oversee the IT. Uh, essential daily functions, uh, we assist the treasurer with the real estate tax administration with over 8,800 customers. We oversee the Act 511 administration, sewer rent collection. We also do the contracts and bids uh, for all of the departments. Uh, we, um, our administrative services coordinator is also our right to know officer and she's fielding over 600 right to know requests per year. Uh, and then the typical accounting stuff with the budgeting, the general ledger, the reporting audit, treasury investments, the accounts payable, and any other special projects. Uh, on the human resources side, we have a human resource coordinator, one person, um, and she's uh, overseeing the bi-weekly payroll of uh, our employees and then the monthly distribution of the retiree benefits. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, she's responsible for administering the benefits to the active and retire employees, retirees. Um, also with the collective bargaining compliance, pension and OPEB reporting compliance, as well as uh, overseeing or coordinating with the Auditor General on our annual pension audits. Uh, and then she's uh, heavily involved in our annual financial audit because uh, payroll is obviously our biggest expense. Uh, and then she's also, she also oversees the scheduling of our switchboard uh, and all the other projects that are, is assigned. Uh, information technology, again, we have one full-time person that oversees this, and this is actually something that has been growing over the last uh, five, six years. Uh, this person oversees our server administration, which is a quick aside. A few years ago, the board voted 
uh, to authorize us to go forward with an ERP system. In doing so, we decided that the best way to do that was having the servers reside here and the data to reside in-house. Uh, that decision not only is paying benefits uh, on a cost benefit with the ERP, but now that we're expanding to the, the body-worn cameras and some of this other technology, having those servers here in-house uh, is saving us more money because we already have the infrastructure and the cost to expand the, the, the size and the capacity is very minimal compared to sourcing that out to a cloud or some third-party company to uh, to house it for us. So those are decisions we made in years past that are uh, paying dividends now. Um, but Bob Hale, uh, I think everybody knows how uh, energetic he is. He is a ping pong ball that bounces all over the room. One minute he's neck deep in a server problem, next he's trying to figure out why someone's keyboard doesn't work, and everything in between. Um, and he's, uh, he's really done a terrific job. Uh, so I just went home. So who does all this? Uh, this is our department. Uh, as the assistant township manager and finance director, uh, I, get, I, I go in the two different directions between what's going on every day. Uh, Bob Tate, as most of you know, uh, is our assistant finance director. He's also our HR manager. He's helping out with the day-to-day -day, uh, or the, the larger scale HR issues. Um, we have a part-time Act 511 intern that comes in and helps us during the busy season uh, around late spring, early summer. And then we have our three divisions uh, and those employees there. We have five full-time uh, in the accounting side, including Bob and myself. We have the one HR coordinator, one IT coordinator, and then a few part-time folks uh, throughout the year to help us out. And at the top, you can see over the last 20 years, the, the staffing within the department has remained relatively stable. The exception is IT. It didn't exist until 2007. At one point, there were three, and now we have just Bob Hale. Um, so with regard to non-payroll, just real quickly, we have various contracts that we have for the 2020 budget. It's include, making sure that those are included. It's the independent audit. It's uh, the Act 511 uh, assistance we get on the auditing and legal side, our, our Tyler Technologies maintenance and server contract. On the HR side, we are considering, right now we uh, use ADP to process the checks for retirees. Uh, now that we have the new software in place, bringing that in-house is something that is um, realistic and could save us a little bit of money. And then on the IT side, uh, continuing with our relationship with Alora, who provides the, um, the, the security to back up an emergency response uh, to help Bob Hale out. Uh, a couple things for consideration looking uh, forward, either near term or long term, is um, getting more and more involved with GIS uh, and perhaps hiring a full-time coordinator uh, or a consultant to help the township uh, and head up, head up uh, the GIS movement to uh, making digitally based decisions uh, since we're dealing with a lot of infrastructure and uh, geographic type uh, decision making. GIS is an extremely useful tool and we'll get into that a lot uh, down the road. Um, as we contemplate adding security cameras in various areas of the township, looking at that at a more comprehensive level, developing the policies and then a plan for implementation. Uh, they are expensive to install. There's, um, on the IT side, there's networking and communication considerations uh, to think about. And if we do it comprehensively, uh, there, it'll be more effective and probably cost savings or cost efficient to, uh, rather than an ad hoc camera here, camera there type approach. Um, and then the other thing that we're looking at in um, coordination with the police department and the other departments of the township is centralizing our cashiering. Um, instead of having five different windows, uh, have a cashiering window uh, that's somewhere in this building convenient for the folks that are coming here and doing business. Uh, so with that, again, I'd just like to thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And um, I can't speak highly enough about the finance department. We have fantastic employees that really care about what they do. Uh, they're not always perfect, they're not always right, um, but uh, they always try to do better all the time, so I can't ask more of that, and I really appreciate them. I appreciate the opportunity to serve, so thank you very much. Um, so I have a note here, distribution of capital, sanitary, and storm water project list. Is that you, or? It could be. Um, I'm having some spreadsheet issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if you don't mind, we, we let's yeah to keep the move, meeting moving along. Okay. Um, let's
let me continue to arm wrestle with this and then we can dive into it. Okay, sounds good. All right, so thank you all very much for being so patient. It is very much appreciated and I know that uh, this is probably taking a little longer than you anticipated, but thank you very much. So first up on my list is the Rider Fire Company. Amen, welcome. Good evening, everyone. My name is Amy Brzezinis, Administrative Director with Radner Fire Company. I'm one of the full-time employees at Radner. I've been there for 11 years. Uh, I also volunteer with Burrow Fire Company. Uh, I've been with them for 21 years. Uh, so for me, this is a 24-7 deal as a volunteer and paid person. Uh, thank you for the commissioners and the staff for having us out this evening. Uh, we're just going to go through um, some things that some of you may have heard about. Certainly the commissioners and staff have heard about. Uh, about how we're doing, how our budget performance has been this year, but also we're looking for in 2020 specifically. Get right into it. Um, the township asked us, you know, who, we wanted to answer the question, who do we serve in Radnor Township? So from an emergency medical services standpoint, uh, Radnor Fire Company provides all the service. So that's referred to as basic life support service and advanced life support service. So basic life support, you fall and break your arm, um, you, have, you know, minor injury type of deal. That's what we refer to as baseline support. You have a cardiac arrest, you have difficulty breathing, you go into shock because you get stung by a bee and you're allergic. That involves advanced life support, paramedic level care. Fire protections broke up uh, in three parts. Uh, it's Radnor Fire Company, Brimar Fire Company, who you hear from in a few minutes, as well as Brimar Fire Company. Radnor Fire Company services all the area west of 320. And then when you get down in the, the far corner of the township near Newtown Square and Brumall, it's cut out a little bit, and then we cover everything west of that, west and north of that area. Uh, so it's the bulk uh, of the township. Uh, if you are called uh, in the Garrett Hill section by Brumall, which oftentimes happens for a structure fire, uh, we're coming to assist them, and vice versa. Uh, Brumall and ourselves uh, work hand in hand a lot. Um, so we've opened the Blue Route together as well, uh, multiple times throughout the year. Uh, this is uh, a chart that we shared with the board uh, earlier this year, back in March, just showing our call volume. Uh, so this shows our 2018 performance as far as calls, 864 fire responses, and a little over 2,300 ambulance calls. Uh, this is just showing you from midnight uh, for the 24-hour <coughs> period what our call volume looks like. Not surprisingly, when everybody's awake, when people are moving around, that's when we're getting the bulk of our calls uh, during the daytime hours. So about 7 a.m., we really start to go up the part of the day we get busy, and that starts to trail off in the overnight hours. I think it's unique if you think about it from a fire perspective. Our fire, we're always cognizant of fire danger, but think about it. Everyone's awake during the day. Fire danger is lower than at night. We're in bed, we're sleeping. Um, that's when most of your fatal fires occur when people are sleeping at night. Um, so it's something you should keep in mind as we talk about staffing and the need for uh, paid staff around the clock. Major projects and issue update um, is, again, many of you have heard, uh, we undertook a five-year community-driven strategic plan. There's some folks uh, from the township staff as well as the commissioners and the public that participated in that uh, process. So we're currently working through the implementation of that plan. Um, as you might have heard about, uh, we, we're doing a big push for volunteers and I brought some extra brochures tonight. Uh, these are getting mailed out to every resident in the township. Step up, stand out, save lives. Uh, that's our updated campaign that we're doing to push volunteerism in the community. Uh, without the volunteers that we have at Radnor, uh, we would have some issues. Uh, we do have paid folks that we talked about, but full-time and part-time, our volunteers are not just responding to calls, they're providing the administration of the company, serving board director roles, and helping with fundraising as well. So it's a big deal for us to continue to push the volunteers involved with our fire company. As a follow-up for a March meeting that we had here at the township, uh, we talked about the increased need for career staff, paid staffing at Radnor. Um, that is now in, in process. Effective September 1st, we've upstaffed. Um, we have a breakdown of what the staffing looks like. 
Um, and that's important because we recognize that we need additional folks, especially during the daytime hours, and a lot of our volunteers are not available to respond to calls. Um, that's why that has taken place, several hundred thousand dollar increase uh, in payroll expense with us doing that. Uh, the one thing, and I can't remember if I mentioned this back in March, but as everyone knows, Penn Medicine has a pretty significant facility that they're building on King of Prussia Road. Uh, we've been in communication with Penn Medicine as a partner, talking about having the ability to have space at their new site. Um, they've uh, talked with us on that, uh, so we're going to have the ability to potentially deploy an ambulance at their facility with office space in their parking garage with the proper uh, components to charge the ambulance. Uh, during peak hours during the day. Uh, so logistical items we still have to work through with Penn Medicine, with the township, um, but from a response time uh, aspect, we're pretty excited about it. Um, one of the huge challenges that we have here at Radnor is the traffic. I'm sure if, if I ask someone to raise their hands, you ever seen us going down the road going to fire call, it's pretty crazy. Um, there's not a lot of room to move around Route 30, especially during lunch time and busy times. So we're going on the wrong side of the road, it can be dangerous. So from an ambulance perspective, where we have most of our call volume, having an ambulance down closer to the only university being able to serve that portion of the township is significant. Uh, reduces liability, um, and it reduces travel time to emergencies as well, uh, which is a positive thing. So it's something we're still working against through some of the logistics, uh, but it's something Penn Medicine has said that they uh, want to work with, with us on, which again is, is good news. Two animals that we currently have, um, those both have been ordered. Uh, one will take, will take delivery just in a couple weeks, and the other one will be coming in March of 2020. Uh, those animals will cost $145,000 and includes current <coughs> trade in value of $42,000 per unit uh, on our analysis. So typically we look to replace just about five, five to six years, depending on how maintenance is performing. Uh, as you can imagine, it's not like a regular car. You're doing a lot of hard stopping and braking and turning, and you have multiple different people driving the unit. So that contributes to the wear and tear on the animals versus your own personal vehicle. One of the other big items we talked about from the March meeting was fleet consolidation. So we're taking one step uh, with that program, and that's with the replacement of engine 51. If you're wondering what an engine is, it's just your basic fire truck. It carries 500, 750 gallons of water, can help fight a fire, can help rescue somebody. Those units can cost anywhere from five to eight hundred thousand dollars, depending on what you're dealing with the unit. Uh, we're going with a smaller unit, which is called TAC 15. It almost looks like an F550 utility type truck, about 300 gallons of water on it. Will give us some different versatility in the township, and that will cost three hundred fifteen thousand dollars. That's been ordered. That will take delivery of that in April of 2020. I already mentioned the career staffing numbers. I try to keep this very simple because a lot of what I talk about, people can get very confused easily. Uh, weekday coverage, so we have six personnel on duty, duty uh, Monday through Friday. That includes myself and a director of EMS operations. So both myself and Brian Zimmerman, who's uh, in this new role, uh, we're both cross-trained, so we respond to fire and EMS calls. Um, so we're providing uh, not just administrative support to the fire company, we're going to responses when they need the help when volunteers are not available. Um, before September 1st, we only had two people on duty. So if we want an ambulance call, that was it. There's really no one else in the station typically. Now there's four people on duty at night. As you saw on the line graph, uh, call volume is less at night, but the idea of having these two extra people there is that if we get a fire response, we at least have two people in place. We have two additional volunteers and we can make the response to go to a fire call. If we get to the weekend, which we can say we're busier for us, especially with colleges, we now have a second crew on duty that can deploy the animals out uh, to an EMS emergency versus relying on our neighbors more so than we probably should. Uh, we look at having delayed responses if we wait for mutual aid to come in. We're really, that, that's something we should be able to take care of. Weekend coverage, uh, the only difference is set up with six on, we have four on during the day. We maintain the four at night, again, primarily for the, for the EMS component. Uh, weekend coverage, as you can probably surmise, is better for us. A lot of our volunteers work full-time and or part-time jobs that aren't located here in the township. Uh, we have a couple folks that have flexibility with their employer to leave for calls, but um, a lot of times like they're out of the game Monday through Friday during the day. Uh, typically, on weekends, they have a little more availability. So, um, 
As far as my communication with the town specifically, a lot is done with Manager Zinkowski and Finance Director uh, White, as well as Assistant Finance Director Tate. We have uh, some communication with commissioners. We're providing our budget reports. So I just want to do a quick snapshot of what we look like this year. Um, so right now we're in the black. Our 107,029. That's through the end of September. Um, our investment income is performed well this year, a little higher than we expected. Uh, that's included in the operating net income so far. As I mentioned, with our fourth quarter, we are going to see an increase in paid staff costs with our new staffing model. And finally, uh, two areas we can work very hard on are apparatus maintenance and repairs and facilities, <coughs> both those expense categories, which are our second, our second and third largest, besides our payroll, obviously. Those are performing below budget, which is excellent. And that's something like we like to see. Career staff, as I mentioned numerous times, this is our number one expense. Uh, as I've sat in meetings for the last several years, uh, we've talked about what, really what's going to be the biggest pressure on the fire company on the bottom line. Uh, as really, as a community, it's going to be the increased need for paid staff. So. Um, this is really looking at where we're at right now in 2019. We're going to finish probably just below a million dollars as far as our payroll. That's all in. That's our benefits. That's our PTO. That's everything. And then it's going to start to jump up uh, pretty significantly in the 2020 and then continue through 2022. Uh, this number is not going to go down. Um, I hope at some point it's going to level off. Um, but this really is going to be the big, biggest thing for us from a budget perspective and working with the township, identifying uh, how we're going to handle this because uh, again we need the people to respond to calls uh, we don't want to take have delays in response unnecessarily there's things we can do as far as getting paid personnel in place to make sure we have an adequate response in the community when we're called upon for fire or a medical emergency uh, so 2020 budget request just getting right to it so I broke it down operating capital and then accountability so on the operating side, uh, $250,000 for increased costs associated with paid staff. Current fu funding for fire apparatus is adequate for 2020. There's no need to adjust that. Uh, we have access to PEMA loans for the state, so we can borrow up to, uh, 2% at different levels depending on the fire truck. We're going to continue to take advantage of that. We also continue to leverage the state relief aid that we receive. Um, that is limited in nature. We cannot use it for paid staff, which is unfortunate. Uh, but we can use it to help with apparatus purchase, which we will continue to do. Um, the one thing that, that we've, we've talked about uh, with, with staff offline is currently the way the capital funding is allocated to the fire companies, it's apparatus. If you look at the budgets under Township Fleet Contribution, Burmar Fire Company, Radnor Fire Company, it's right in there. Um, if there's any additional uh, flexibility with the Township or any type of capital support, we'd like to see some flexibility with how we can use that money. The biggest capital expense that's staring us in the face has been a problem for a while is our front apron and the sidewalk. As everyone knows, we it literally floods in front of the firehouse. Uh, water comes back into the firehouse at times, um, and we ignore wear and tear on that front apron. It needs to get replaced. If you have an opportunity, walk across our apron, and you have little dips and edges and all kinds of cracks and things, and it's not a good situation. So we'd like to deal with that at some point. Uh, one of the ways to deal with it is using leveraging those capital funds you receive from the township. The one thing I think the township did smartly is we started. Um, well, how far back does this go with the apparatus? Two hundred thousand, probably five six years ago at yeah, this point. Yeah, two thousand twelve. So the township, the years prior, would just say, "Okay, Radnor needs a truck. All right, what's a check?" And they would just really pay for the whole thing in full. Okay, it's nice, but from a planning perspective, from the township, let's smooth it out. So they do two hundred thousand dollars year over year put that in escrow fund and then we draw down on that but we need to buy a fire truck. As you can suspect, the frequency which you replace fire trucks versus animals are two different animals. So our ladder truck that we bought in 2011, $825,000 less equipment, that is uh, going to be replaced at the 18 year mark, 15 to 18 year mark is the target. We're nowhere near that. Uh, the animals is our, the vehicle that's continually getting replaced on a more frequent basis. Um, so the thought is we have some of that capital money sitting there, we don't need to draw down off our apparatus that we have permission or authorization from the township to deploy that for capital capital project, like the front apron and sidewalk, which uh, I don't know Steve or CD Slayer, he's he's aware of, of the issues up front as well. Um, so that's the last two things. As far as the accountability component, uh, finance director White, uh, you know, he, he talked about that, the importance of you know 
and being ethical, making sure we're, we're being good stewards of, of township tax dollars. And something we want to make sure the fire company, we're holding up our end of the bargain in that regard. So um, I guess I'll work a little bit backwards. So yeah, obviously we continue to provide updates to the township. We have regular communication with uh, Manager White, or uh, Finance Director White and Manager Zikowski. Uh, we will continue to do that. Uh, one thing we've talked about, but I think it's important just to get it down on paper, is to leverage the public safety committee that the commissioners already have. <coughs> incorporate a fire chief or operational representative as well as a board of director or administrative person from the three fire companies in the township to sit around the table. It's, it's you know, public meetings at times, and we kind of go through and ever managing uh, basically all the money for fire EMS. Uh, this is big money. Uh, there's a lot of hard decisions that need to get made. Um, and we need to make sure we you know, continue that. Obviously, <coughs> our interaction with the staff is very important. We also need to make sure the commissioners are engaged in that as well. Uh, so that's an important uh, thing for us at Radnor. Those are only involved necessarily asking for money, it's just kind of a procedure, and we think that's important to have us uh, you know, be a part of that formally. Um, the last thing I just talked about with accountability, maybe it doesn't happen this year, but if we can target it for next year, it would be great. Adopting a standard of cover. And standard of cover is simply determining what do we want as a community, how fast we want a fire truck to ride at someone's house to call 911. How fast, if I'm having a heart attack, do I want the animals to arrive at my house? Because those things drive a lot of our decisions around, okay, how many people do we need? If we have certain times of the day that we can't physically get there, well, if Bob comes to me and says, Damon, what's going on between you know, 3 p.m. and 8 p.m., what can we do here? Well, we need to have a discussion about it. It's really critically taking a look at that. What do we want as a community across the board? Not just for Radnor, for Bremar and Brewer, it's got to be standardized, because that will drive a lot of the future decision making around budget requests, like we're talking about tonight. And that is all I have. I just want to keep it moving. I appreciate your time and attention, sir, and commissioners and staff for the public have any questions. I'd be happy to answer them. supervisor position to streamline some of the administrative responsibilities, take it away from some of the board just so it's done every day in-house and it's reviewable. Uh, that's added to our payroll. So as we look forward to this next year, our budget hasn't changed significantly except for that one, one higher. Uh, we would request the normal normal bump that we get kind of <coughs> see fit to give us more that would be great to help um, questions
I like Burma. Burma beats it. That's a fair point. I don't know if you big service 
um, is, is providing free Wi-Fi. We have a lot of folks who come into the library who work from home, uh, are going to school online. Uh, on average, each month, almost 25,000 connections to our Wi-Fi happen, and the average connection is 68 minutes. So it's not like they're just driving by. They're actually stopping into the library um, and using uh, the internet. So, you know, what does this return to our community? I used the American Library Association's library value calculator um, and took some of our average monthly statistics, like how many books circulate, DVDs, eBooks, our museum passes, and then also the programs and the free meeting space that we're able to offer. Um, and with that value calculator, I came out with uh, more than $255,000 a month which would be $3 million a year, and our budget is $1.4 million. So I think we're doing a pretty good job of offering a lot of bang for your buck. Um, so looking ahead, we are um, moving into implementing a new five-year strategic plan. Uh, we began in February of this year to work with a consultant, and we engaged more than 1,000 residents and community leaders, some of you in this room again, uh, were part of those discussions to really find out what the township is looking for uh, in moving the library forward. We developed six core goals to focus our work uh, in the coming years, and we're really looking forward to introducing that plan to the public in the next few weeks. Um, and then expanding our reach within the community. Um, so we get you know that 41% up, even higher, and the use of the rooms and, and that sort of thing, uh, even higher. So that's uh, you know kind of what we're looking at for 2020. Um, based on uh, some uh, internal discussions and, and what we saw in the finance director's uh, presentation last week, um, the library is, is going to request a two and a half percent increase over the contribution that the township gave us last year. So that is an additional twenty-four thousand uh, dollars, bringing that contribution up to nine hundred and eighty-four thousand. Uh, you know, we we uh, thought this was in line with what we were seeing proposed elsewhere in the budget and it will allow us uh, to continue to enhance our services um, and just grow these numbers and our reach even more. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention um, that we've discussed with the township and, and uh, with Commissioner Borowski um, is the west side porch of the library. That was something that wasn't addressed uh, in our giant renovation project uh, but still sort of is weighing on our library board the liability issue there um, there are some safety concerns on that west side porch uh, during the project it was um, looked at and quoted at a hundred thousand dollars by the contractor so we knew that wasn't really in line with reality um, so we don't have any hard and fast numbers at this point although in discussions with mr. Norsini he you know thought that it would be much less um, so you know the, the library board um, you know would like to encourage the commissioners to consider that as you're looking at your long list of capital projects so that's all I have for you this evening. Uh, I will leave you with a takeaway. Uh, but thank you. Thank you so much.
nationally accredited senior center. Uh, we're just close to finishing um, our third round of the accreditation process, um, and that's through the uh, National Institute of Senior Centers in Washington, D.C. Um, there's only a very small uh, percentage of um, senior centers across the nation uh, that go through this pretty rigorous accreditation process. Um, we're very proud of uh, the modernization that we brought to uh, the senior center in the past or so uh, through a variety of grants um, and uh, township funding. Um, we have been able to update our kitchen to a commercial kitchen, which has enabled us to expand our uh, programming for our older adults um, and our new program. Uh, we've updated our bathrooms to be ADA um, accessible, um, and we've installed energy efficient windows. And then this past fiscal year, uh, we received grant funding to update the lighting to energy efficient LED lighting. Um, and we installed a new security and alarm system, including cameras, uh, to the perimeter of the building. Um, we like to think that we're good uh, stewards of uh, the property that uh, has allowed us to, um, to live in, to so call our home. Um, just a little bit about some of the programs that we offer. Uh, we always promote um, positive, healthy aging um, to the older adults that we serve. Uh, one program that we're um, very uh, happy about um, is our Chef's Table at Wayne Senior Center program that we launched this past year. Uh, we just received uh, the program of the year by the Pennsylvania Association of Senior Centers, so we named the best program um, at all the senior centers in Pennsylvania, and uh, we invite local chefs from our restaurants to come in and provide a cooking demonstration for our um, members, and then they also pre prepare, uh, prepare us a restaurant quality meal. Um, we do serve a daily lunch. Last year we served over 5,000 meals uh, to members of the community. Uh, we offer health and wellness screenings. Uh, we have a partnership with Mainline Health um, for flu clinic. Uh, they come in weekly to provide blood pressure screenings. Um, we do a lot of brain fitness and memory fitness. Uh, we do have a fitness center at the senior center. Um, we provide uh, a, a personal trainer who last year um, provided over 285 personal training hours, and we have about 12 uh, group fitness classes a week, um, everything from tap dancing to line dancing, um, tai chi, yoga, a little bit uh, of everything, something for everyone. Um, and then we do entertainment, uh, day trips, um, and lots of enrichment programs, um, a lot of programs with uh, community partners, the library, and a lot of other groups in this room. Um, we have 567 active members right now. 70% um, of our membership are Radnor Township residents. Um, because of where we're located, we do pull in um, members from other townships and um, a few uh, members from other um, counties. Um, in addition, we also last year served over 1,700 older adults um, through various services that we provide. Um, we do a lot of information and referral. Um, we have our support net program, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, we do a prize Medicare counseling, health screenings, food clinics, group partnerships, uh, free legal assistance, um, and then the most popular is our AARP tax preparation. Um, last year, our tax volunteers um, prepared over 300 um, returns for older adults and saved them hundreds of thousands of dollars in filing fees. Um, just a little bit about um, our income and expenses at the center. Um, we like to think that we run a pretty lean um, machine. Um, <laughs> we, um, the majority of our funding does come from uh, Radnor Township and uh, COSA, about half. Uh, COSA is the Office of Aging for Delaware County. Um, we are responsible in um, <coughs> raising the rest of our funds. Um, Majority of that are grant and foundations, which are becoming uh, pretty increasingly competitive. Um, donations, uh, sponsorships uh, from local organizations um, and corporations, and then center collections. Um, there is no fee to join the senior center. Um, all of our activities are um, donation-based, um, including our lunch, and we're finding more and more, um, we're getting more older adults who are unable to provide um, contribution or as much of a con contribution as they were able to in the, in the past. Um, and then 83% of um, our expenses do go towards uh, the programs and the services. Um, 
that we provide for our seniors. Um, and then we have a very small staff. Um, it's myself and our program coordinator who are full time. And we have three part time staff members um, and then host of volunteers. Um, uh, last year, um, Bradner Township uh, contributed $145,000 towards uh, our annual budget, um, and that included the $15,000 increase um, to help support, um, help us establish and uh, support our support net program. And we are requesting um, sustained funding for um, this fiscal year of $145,000. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about the impact of the support net program um, and those additional funds. Um, we had uh, applied for a uh, grant through the Foundation for Delaware County and were awarded um, a partial grant. Um, and so the township uh, very generously um, made up the difference for us. Um, we were able to uh, hire a part-time social worker in March of 2019. Um, and since then, she's been able to provide one-on-one -on -one, um, intense social service um, intervention to 69 individuals. 25% um, of those individuals have been uh, Wayne Senior Center members, but the majority of them, um, over 75%, came from um, referrals within the community um, from what we like to call gatekeepers. Um, gatekeepers are um, community resources, um, the police department, uh, the library, uh, our local faith-based community, any individual um, or organization that may come in contact with a vulnerable older adult, um, so they made the um, referral. Um, and our support net coordinator um, has been able to um, address health needs, um, offer benefit screenings uh, for various <coughs> entitlements, um, the biggest issue has been housing that we've come across. Um, a lot of seniors have uh, been living in their house, houses for a very long time and their houses are aging along with them. So inability uh, to pay for repairs or property or school taxes, um, difficulty with that. Um, and then food insecurity, um, we've established a partnership with a local food bank um, and then utility assistance. Uh, support net, um, our support net coordinator has also established a couple of new programs uh, to serve um, our seniors. Uh, we have a dinner with friends, which is a monthly uh, community dinner. Um, so we invite anybody to come in and join. Um, we may have a little presentation um, and then everybody enjoys a meal together uh, that we prepare uh, together at the senior center. Um, and then our friendship line, which is uh, a telephone um, like social line. Uh, you can sign up to uh, have your uh, phone number shared with a list of other individuals and you agree to make and receive phone calls and it's just a way to expand your social circle um, after the hours of the senior center so when everybody goes home in the evening um, and might be feeling isolated or lonely. Um, I want to share a little bit about um, <laughs> one of our members. Nancy gave me uh, permission to share her story. Um, she's been a proud uh, Radnor Township resident of 28 years. Um, she is a recent widow, um, and when we met her, she was living in um, unsafe, unaffordable housing. Um, she had lost her husband um, and had lost a lot of, um, obviously, like social support um, and financial support that he provided. Um, we met, when we met her, she was experiencing food insecurity um, and had trouble paying her bills. Um, she came into the center at the recommendation of a friend, um, started coming in every day. Um, joining us for lunch and when we hired our support net coordinator we got to know Nancy um, a lot better through um, her interaction with our support net coordinator. Um, support net was able to assist Nancy uh, with budgeting. She was living um, really beyond her means because of her um, inability to afford um, her rent, um, some of her bills. Uh, she was facing shutoff um, notices for a lot of her utilities. Um, she was making that hard decision between uh, does she pay for a $10 prescription for uh, one of her medications or um, to purchase groceries. Um, and so our support coordinator worked with her um, to find a more affordable, safe um, housing, which is uh, difficult, <laughs> um, and to work out a budget um, and um, address her food insecurity. Um, and then through, uh, we were introduced to uh, the Good Works volunteers in the local faith-based community um, through uh, Chief Flanagan. Um, and those volunteers were wonderful. Um, they, along with our coordinator, helped um, to pack and clean Nancy's old apartment. 
um, which was just so overwhelming to her, um, which is part of why she just stayed in her apartment as long as she did. She just could not uh, imagine uh, doing all that herself as she has no children and no family in the area. Um, and they moved her and unpacked her into um, a new apartment and now she's thriving. She is just uh, a few uh, blocks away from the senior center. She walks in every day um, and still joins us for lunch and is a great volunteer at the center. Um, and then I just want to invite everybody uh, to our, well, you're welcome to come into the Senior Center at any time. We'd love to see everyone. Um, but uh, we're having our holiday open house um, the night of the Wayne Tree Lighting. Uh, we have free hot cocoa and cookies and uh, a wonderful holiday train display uh, that's fun for all, all, all ages. Um, and everybody's welcome.
offered small trees. So for those people that have wires, for the first time they were able to register for trees and we planted a lot of pretty flowering dogwoods and redwoods, in addition to all the big canopy trees. Um, our electronic tree street survey. So Bob, thank you. I think two years ago you invested in this for us and we are 85% of the way complete. So all everything you're gonna see tonight, just like last year, is all based on data. Um, donations increased. Radnor Conservancy for the first time gave us a donation in the order of $6,000. So we're very appreciative for that. That's in addition to the donation that we typically get from Shanna Claire. So we think that, we hope that, and think that that's due to all the good work that we're doing. Um, and resident communication, it's one of the things that we increased this year and we're looking to do even more of it next year. Okay, so where are we with regards to the data? So with 85% of the right of way streets surveyed, good news is we know at least 50% of our trees are healthy and they're free of cables. 15% of our trees are basically hazardous and need to come down. Now the good news is that um, under Bob, Public Works did a really great job this year, and this will sound odd for somebody like me to say, but we took down more trees than any other year, and this is a good thing, because otherwise they're just gonna come down in storms. So this is actually good news. Okay, so now we're gonna go to 2019, and this is in the world of trees planted. Okay, so the spring tree planting and the fall tree planting, we did this year. So that was in the neighborhood of, let's say, 110 trees or so. Then Bo Connor and Briarwood, the township took care of, they did those, they took some funds out of our budget and, and did those. Cabrini, we had a large uh, fine from them, basically where they took down a number of trees and so therefore for our tree replacement formula, they had to donate about 100 trees. 88 are going to parks and 12 more are going to augment the good work that you did with the uh, Wayne business area. So they're gonna be planted in the North Wayne parking lot keep regreening that whole area. Um, and then here's us taking credit for your good work. <laughs> the 60, it should, it looks, yeah, the 60 trees that went in that um, look fabulous and, and just went in, you know, this week that Steve spoke of. So all in all, we're well over 300 trees and we've got Pico donating another four trees that will go in uh, probably by the end of this month. Okay, trees were moved. Okay, so this, like I said, is actually good news. Um, the good news is the hazardous trees that came down at least are larger than the healthy trees that came down. So that's good. Okay. Those in the big blue box are the ones that Steve McNeilis and Public Works took down, which is the highest number that we've seen so far, and this is good because they have to come down. That's what we're seeing from the tree survey, is that we really have a bolus of hazardous trees that are either in severe decline, um, or a hazardous need to come down now. So he, he made a good dent taking down about 190 trees and we have about 600 that are hazardous. So, so this is a good dent in that bucket. Um, the other yellow bar shows hazardous trees removed by residents. That's good as well. And then the healthy trees are at the residents um, election to actually take them down. And so if there's six or more in that green bar, they come to us and report it. And by the tree replacement formula, they're obligated to replace them. And the orange is just our best ballpark at how many trees we think are coming down that don't have to come before us. So if you put this all together, what does this mean? So this basically shows you 2014, the blue bars are trees coming out, yellow bars, trees going in. So you can see 2019, we really expanded in both directions. So we took down a record number of trees, but we also planted a record number of trees. So I think this is good. I would predict we're gonna need to do the same in 2020, and maybe by 2021, we won't have quite so many hazardous trees. So I would still expect a big bolus of trees that Bob and Public Works are gonna have to take out over the next two years. Um, and taking out trees is more expensive than planting trees. So they're really the folks that are gonna need the money. Then for us, I just projected out, hey, if we plant the same number of trees that we did this year, let's say in the number of about 150 trees, that's what it would look like. So the cumulative effect would be blue-based
basically shows you each year whether your trees are going up or down. And as you can see, for 2019, for the first year, we planted more trees than what we took out. The yellow line kind of shows you the cumulative effect. And at least what it's showing you is, hey, if we plant 150 trees per year and we still remove all these hazardous trees, by about 2021, we should start to do an uptick. Okay, so, so it's good news. At least we're starting to reverse the trend. Okay, so now we get to the money part. Bill, this is for you. I have check marks in there. I'm sure that doesn't meet the finance code, but <laughs> this is what you get. <laughs> so anyhow, this is basically just looking back. When I was here last year, it was our first time presenting the budget, and we didn't really do a budget per se. We did a five-year strategic plan, and we just looked holistically at the township. We didn't say which pocket of money it had to come from, whether it was public works or shade tree committee or somewhere else. So that's where you saw last year, we said, hey, we need a million dollars. The bulk of that money was to remove trees, about $800,000 to remove trees, given all the hazardous trees we noted on our tree survey. Okay, and as we said, Steve McNeilis has done a good job at making a dent in that. Um, and that's what we're showing there. Public works, um, so Steve took down about 190 of the 600 trees. Um, and also, we had this shade tree committee, about $100,000 in that committee. And then, of course, you did your bond, you know, which went to the Wayne business area. I don't know if that comes to a million, but it's in the ballpark somewhere. Okay, so then for expenditures. Okay. We did the uh, fall big tree planting. We did the street tree planting. Everything in red is what we think that we basically have removed. So at the end of the day, the shade tree expenses, we were asking for 149,000, you gave us 102,000. That's in the ballpark, so we thank you for that. I, I think we did some good work with that this year. Bill, this should be a little better. <laughs> no check marks. No problem. <laughs> okay. So this is just an estimate of our revenues based on historically what we have gotten in. And then expenditures. This assumes that we'll do a spring planting, a fall planting, each one 75 trees. Um, communication, it's one of the things that we want to increase. We think if we can get neighbors and residents and businesses to understand, hey, you don't have to worry about tr a tree falling on your house if you can just identify it's, if it's healthy. And if it's not, this is who to contact if you need to take it down. So we want to do more of leading with a carrot, you know, in instead of the stick, instead of the enforcement side. Um, and so our ask comes out to be $112,000, and that would leave about $2,000 in the fund. Okay. And I'll, I'll let Bill double check that if it's all accurate, but that should be about right. And in our whole mission, one of the things that we realized in previous years is that we always had a large balance at the end. And frankly, if, not, if I was in your shoes, I wouldn't give us money if we kept running with a large balance, because you can deploy that money elsewhere. So that's where we think we made good use of it last year. We're looking to do the same again in 2020. And then just lastly, I just want to say thank you. This is our talented group of people. We appreciate the new people that you've been recruiting. Um, we definitely needed some marketing and communications help, and you definitely gave us Seth, who's, uh, that talent is right up his alley. And uh, people like, Matt Golis, I just want to call out because it's he and his wife, Jane Golis, who's a certified arborist who did all the survey work. Um, and we will be complete possibly um, by mid-November. So we're, we're really proud of the work that they've done and everyone else here. So we just want to say thank you and please use us in 2020. Any questions? So your ask is 112? Yes. Okay, 112. Okay. Okay. It looks like you have revenue of 53. <coughs> so is the 112 separate from the revenue? We have a beginning fund <coughs> balance of 61,000. And that's what Bill will need to check because, you know, we'll see at the end of the year exactly where we land. But that's where we think we're going to land at 61,000. So that plus the 53,000 comes to in the neighborhood of about 112. Grants donations are coming from the township, right? right. Transfers come from the township, I believe, of 25000 The $6,000 would be if Radnor Township, if, sorry, Radnor Conservancy were to donate again, and the 18000 would be Shannon Claire. So if we get the same donations that 
we got in 2019. Same transfer of 25,000, and we have a starting balance of 61,000. We should be about breaking even at the end of the year. So, what's your request from the township then? We want to have in our budget $112,000 to spend. And so that would be, you could deduct from the township, you could deduct the 18,000 and the 6,000, the 24,000 that would come from outside sources, outside of the township. But also the fees and fines, since we wouldn't, right. the normal That's course true. of events ideally pay for that. Right, yep, you could add in basically $3,600 there as well. And also the interest. So basically, it sounds like you're asking for the $25,000 in transfers that you would typically get from the general fund. Correct. We saved a lot of money. I like it. In addition to leaving us the starting balance. <coughs> yeah. So we have to make sure we preserve the 61. Yes. And then you'd like an additional 25 on top of that. Exactly. Uh, Madam President, if I, if I could. So this is based, no, not based, this is the shade tree fund. We have a completely separate fund established for this activity. It's it's required by our code, uh, and our code dictates that that the balances in that fund must remain in that fund and be used for that fund's purpose. So uh, we can't take that money and do something else with it. It's got to be. You're for, just asking for twenty-five. That's that's really what this boils down to is asking the board to keep the twenty-five thousand dollar transfer as part of uh, the budget, and then the rest of it will go in as the Shade Tree Fund's budget for 2020. Unless there's uh, something else that changes with, you know, during our discussions. Thank you, Eileen. Thank, Thank you for all your hard work. <coughs> yep. Okay, uh, Wayne Art Center.
to keep expanding and growing the Wayne Art Center. Um, Wayne Art Center partners with many organizations throughout Radnor Township and Delaware County, and we are uh, always welcoming other organizations to get involved and collaborate with us on uh, a variety of different projects. The mission of the Wayne Art Center is dedicated to enriching our community through the arts Dedicated to enriching our community through the arts, the mission of the Wayne Art Center is to afford artists and the broader community an interdisciplinary venue to explore, share, and learn while fostering a sense of community for arts and appreciation. I have the opportunity to travel around the country to a variety of conferences <coughs> and also get feedback from visitors that come through the Wayne Art Center every year that feel Wayne Art Center is one of the finest art centers in our country, not just locally, but um, it, it just amazes me how many people are awed when they come in through our doors um, that are coming from places just like out in Connecticut, outside of New York City, for example, and you would think they would have a really wonderful art center there, and they come to us and, um, you know, inform us um, and, you know, kind of confirm um, <laughs> that we've done a good job in, uh, in um, growing and the Wayne Art Center. Um, Wayne Art Center welcomes over 30,000 visitors each year to its expansive light filled facility. We have two major galleries. We have the Ethel Sergeant Clark Smith Gallery and we have the Davenport Gallery. But we also have smaller gallery spaces such as the Bidinghoff Lobby Gallery, our Link and Kitchen Galleries. And we are over the year probably featuring around 20 exhibitions. Um, so we are really busy um, coming up with ideas for exhibitions, installing exhibitions, and, and uh, opening exhibitions to the public. In addition to having uh, exhibitions open, we also then uh, create public programming where we're bringing people back in to see the shows and get involved in a more intensive way in, in uh, understanding the art. We have four light filled painting studios. Um, that are really state of the art. Uh, people come to take classes at Wayne Art Center because we have such wonderful painting studios. We have two lovely ceramic studios. Again, with a lot of natural light, we have a, a well-equipped jewelry studio, and we have a gourmet kitchen that we constructed in our last expansion where we offer quite a variety of different types of culinary programs. We also have six music studios, and we offer a variety of music instruction, and, and, uh, piano, violin, viola, guitar, bass, voice, um, and we really don't have enough uh, music studios uh, to really accommodate the people that are requesting uh, lessons. We also have a small gift shop that we have available for our students and also community members. We have a lot of people walking uh, uh, along the trail that come in and stop in to see our exhibits and also to our, see our shop. We also are fortunate to have <coughs> six custom landscape gardens that were completed um, shortly after our, our last expansion. Um, we had to take a little while to get them done because uh, right after we finished our expansion, uh, the economy took a uh, turn for the worse and uh, we had to wait a little bit, but we, we got them completed and um, it really is an enhancement to our property. Um, our team. Um, I've been uh, executive director. I'll be going into my 33rd year actually in 2020. Um, we have a really committed board of directors, um, 120 instructors, five full time staff, and seven part time staff. But we also have approximately 200 volunteers, over, over 70 of them are team volunteers that come every summer to um, help out at summer art camp. We have two. Radnor High School interns um, that are really committed and have been really a great help to the Wayne Art Center. Approximately 5,000 students take, play, take part in our program, uh, student enrollments that is, um, that we, uh, we um, calculate every year of all ages. And we have approximately 500 classes and workshops through, throughout the year. This past weekend, we had two workshops in addition to all our classes. We had a painting workshop and we also had a paper making workshop. Um, so every single weekend, um, in addition to all the classes that we offer, we are hosting workshops with um, instructors from all over our country that are, are coming in to present uh, very specific um, types of uh, programs. Um, as I mentioned, we have culinary programs, classes, workshops. We offer team
team building activities for local corporations and businesses. And again, I mentioned we have our music program. We have also an honor string orchestra. And our summer art camp, uh, we have more than 1,600 student enrollments uh, every summer. This year we were up in enrollment and uh, frankly we're, we're pretty much almost at capacity. Um, our outreach programs. Um, we started a program um, several years ago called Meet Me at WAC. It's modeled on a program that was started at the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, we, we have individuals come in for um, um, some type of a gallery um, activity and then it's followed up by a, um, an art making activity. Um, it's really popular and um, it's really wonderful to see these seniors come in and, and take advantage of this program. Um, a lot of retirement communities in the area take part in it. We have Plus Art, which is a free class for seniors in need. It was started in the 1970s, and we're still going strong with that program. We started a program called Broaden Your World, where we offer free classes for individu individuals with traumatic brain injury. We, um, we offer two classes, two days of art instruction at the Timothy School in Berlin, um, and serve 60 students weekly. We also do a lot of Boy Scout and Girl Scout activities. Um, and we're really open to um, many, many other types of groups that, that contact us. We just got a call today from Devro, and they want to come in and do some ceramic classes at the Wayne Art Center. Um, we have a lot of uh, community partnerships. We're really, as I said, very proud to be a part of Radnor Township. We, we collaborate as much as we can with Radnor Township. Uh, we just took part in the uh, trick-or-treat and also in the, uh, the fall harvest um, celebration and um, we do things with Renner Township School District, uh, Renner Conservancy, we've, we've hosted co-hosted exhibitions with them, we're talking about trying to um, get involved in another collaboration in the future. We, we partner with Shauna Clear, um, local private schools, and uh, we're doing a program with St. David's Episcopal Church after-school program that we're um, um, uh, co-hosting with them um, a couple of, um, days a week we go up there and do our programming with them. 30% um, of what Wayne Art Center's budget comes from individuals, foundation, corporate, and um, government entities. So 70% of our, oh, excuse me, I go backwards. Um, um, so that, that means that we work really hard during the year. We, we have 70% of our budget is from earned income. So that means it's all coming from all the tuition that we're bringing in and the exhibitions that we're hosting. And um, so um, in 2009, our funding was uh, 17500 for Radnor Township. We're hoping that we will raise it to $20,000 this year to help us um, with all of the programming that, that we provide for the township. That's really less than 1% of Wayne Art Center's annual operating budget, which um, this year uh, is projected to be uh, $2 million. Um, what are the benefits to Radnor Township? Um, there's an increased capacity for after-school summer programming. We have uh, increased tourism in Radnor Township. So all the exhibits and activities that we um, present every year, we get a lot of people coming in through the township that are um, frequenting the um, townships, uh, stores and hotels and restaurants, and um, I think that, that really is, is a great thing for Radnor Township. Um, we increase community collaboration for outreach programs, and you know we, uh, the township receives increased recognition as a leading arts community. Um, not many communities, I think, have an art center as fine as Wayne Art Center. And um, from our calculations, over 6% of Wayne Art Center enrollment is comprised of Radnor Township residents. Um, we have a very strong um, following from Radnor Township. So Wayne Art Center would like to thank, let me see, where the thank you is. <laughs> I guess I'm not quite there yet. Wayne, Wayne Art Center has been a significant sustaining supporter of the arts community for nearly 90 years. Um, the combined efforts of Renner Township and Wayne Arts Center provide a compelling basis which to attract additional revenue to Renner Township. The established relationship between Wayne Arts Center and Renner Township continues to benefit a diverse population in our community. 
So again, we thank Renner Township for all their continued support over the years and for recognizing us as a valued community cultural resource. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. Okay, Radnor Historical Society. So that 
um, people who have a house that has some historic uh, interest, it could be the owner, it could be uh, whoever built it, or it could be the architect. We can um, have a, a, a plaque, a plaque that you know for Hintera. So if you go to the website, you can see thousands of images. That all of our images have been scanned and available for, for searching. And uh, many maps and uh, railroad atlases were scanned and are um, by very high, high resolution by the uh, FNA in Philadelphia, and they are available on the website as well. Uh, so uh, when, when we started getting money from the township, we uh, realized that the best way to use it would be to towards the house, which has, as I said, was built in 1789. And um, not that we haven't fixed it over the years, but it was in, in need of repair. So on the left is a picture from about 10 years ago, and this is from over the weekend. So we just completed a, a major renovation that was um, begun by having it a building assessment by a historic architect. I talked to the group about this last year. And that was our first step to do. For the first time, the house is really assessed by someone who knows old houses. And it was, it was good news, mostly. They said the house was basically in good condition. But they came up with a maintenance plan budget for us, which, which included itemized maintenance plans, and it plan, which is basically deferred maintenance, things that really needed to be done as soon as possible. A cyclic, cyclical maintenance plan, which just is your, your, your everyday kind of things, getting the leaves, uh, um, getting the lawn mowed and the snow removed and all that. And then they came up with what an important number for us is the reserve replacement fund. So for all of the things in a house that need to be replaced, the boiler, the roof, uh, the, the siding, there is a, each thing has a, 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 a lifespan and then you have to plan to replace it at the end of that lifespan. So for an institution like us, we need to put aside $10,000 annually so that when the boiler breaks or the roof needs to be replaced, we will have that money on hand. And then in addition to that, we, they gave us suggestions and we told them what we, our wish list and they came up with pro programmatic upgrades. And this is kind of a scary slide, and I'm not going to ask you to, but it is, it's a very detailed <laughs> spreadsheet that is an active document. So when we do something, we can plug in a number, pull out a number, and it's going to give us a, an idea of what we need to do. So in yellow, you see it goes all the way out to the year 2037. They did it out to 10 years, to 20, 2018 to 2028, and told us what we need to replace, what we need to do in five years, what we need to do in 10 years. And there was also a, a list of programmatic upgrades. What we want to put at age back, we want to do this, we want to do that. So we, using the money the township gave us, some plus some um, money that we had raised with uh, the Art Rossin fundraising event, so plus some of the money in our reserves, because the Redmond Historical Society has been <coughs> operating in the black for many years and holding on to a nest egg, which we decided needed to be partly spent to take, take care of a lot of this deferred maintenance. We cherry picked, we, we, we chose mostly exterior repairs and maintenance to take care of the envelope of the building. We chose the third floor storage access as an important programmatic upgrade and um, and we've just been focusing on it. We've been pretty good about our cyclic maintenance. So just, just to give you an idea of uh, the con condition of the house, we decided to work on the, all of the exterior envelope, the roof, the stucco, the, the, um, the wood elements, and we, we discovered in the process we had to replace the roof in the front sooner than we thought we did, but um, we still we spent a little more than we thought we would. And then we, we did, because it is a historic house, uh, it has kind of painted a little bit over the years, bit by bit, we decided to really investigate what the true historic colors were. So we found this really beautiful difference between the dark, almost green-black, to that pretty uh, bluish teal green. Um, and we found that out by investigating the paint layers by taking samples and trying to do it, you know, the way they really should with a historic house. So looking at the before and after, you can see we found that the sashes were all red instead of white, that the shutters were solid, not picked out in color, and then the Queen Anne shingles had a lovely green-gray color. So I think um, sh she really looks good. Um, and just to give you an idea of the costs, uh, the things we chose to do was an interior work, which I didn't really show you pictures of. We now have, in our apartment, we now have, um, it's been repainted and, and, and repaired, and we now have a new doorway that allows us to get to the <coughs> third floor for storage. Before it had been, only the uh, tenants could get to the third floor. And then we did all the exterior work. So the cost of renovations is about, about roughly 160,000. And from, for really, this is about, this is really what we spent the money on that we accumulated for the last four years with the, the generosity of the township, but it really, can't ex express our gratitude enough because we could not have done the kind of job we did if we didn't have that support. And 
again, we did dig into our reserves to the tune of seventy thousand dollars. So move, uh, moving forward, the next projects that we need to um, address are repointing, flashing, and capping the chimneys, uh, getting an HVAC system, painting the wagon house, which is not a historic structure, but is badly in need of a paint job and no longer matches the house. Uh, storm windows and uh, beginning work on the interior of the historic structure. So just to give you an idea of our budget, we are a small, a very small organization. Our operating budget, we usually um, bring in about, the apartment rent this year was really low because the apartment was closed for a good chunk of the year. But we br usually bring in about um, uh, 40, 40, 40 to $50,000. And we usually spend about the same, but this year because of the renovations, we spent a, a lot more. So we, we, we're going to go out on a limb and ask for a little more from the township. Um, and one of the reasons is, um, you know, the replacement, res the reserve replacement fund we think is a good, maybe it's something that the township could wrap, the, wrap their mind around is something that really is for the future. And then the, the wagon house, um, which will complete the, the look of the property would be, I think, a really positive thing in, in the community. And then we have a lot of people in um, the community that keep saying, what happened to the <coughs> Conestoga Wagon? What happened to the car? We used to, for about 15 years, this was in the parade because it had been renovated and we were renting horses and a drayer every year to do it. But about five years ago, we, we no longer had access to the, to the horses and it's become quite expensive. So we were hoping that with, we spent some money on the wagon, which probably needs a little bit of tweaking, and it's now costs about two thousand dollars to get the horses to pull the wagon. We thought this might be something that the township would want to under, underwrite. So that's uh, that's our budget ask. And I just wanted to show you the um, the people who are on the board of directors. Again, we're an all volunteer organization. We have other volunteers, but many of the board members are the people who sit and, and guide, who who take the phone calls, who do the research, who sometimes do the painting and, and the weeding and the planting. And uh, we are in the process of, we're, we're down to only 10. We, we can have as many as 18 board members. So so I ask you two things. Please come and visit if you've never been. Um, we're open Tuesdays and Saturdays. Please check out the website. And if you are interested in serving on the board or, in volunteer, or volunteering, um, let us know. We are looking for people with development expertise and marketing expertise because we understand that we can't be dependent on the township for money. We need to be doing a better job of raising money from this community. So thank you for your attention. Good evening, everybody. We're your home stretch. We're almost there. I am Bob Madonna. I am the uh, president and CEO of Surrey Services. And Chrissy Sadell is with me. She's the senior director of Social Impact. And um, in your package, there's lots of really good information. Uh, I want to cover, I know it's late, I want to cover some high points. First of all, thank you. Um, the last two, this is my third time here. I've been the uh, president and CEO for four years. The last two years, we've been able to have a balanced budget. And without your help, we could not. Uh, this year coming up, we're having a struggle. Uh, we're anticipating, unfortunately, have to go in our reserves because it's getting tougher and tougher to make the budget be balanced. There's 43,700 nonprofits in our area, in the Philly area, so everybody's competing for dollars. Um, a little bit about Surrey is we've been around, we're having our 40th anniversary. Interesting, I've heard a lot of people next year are having big anniversaries. It'll be our 40th. We were founded by a Radnor resident, Jean LaRoche, 39 years ago, and Surrey was all about neighbors helping neighbors. Our mission is to keep older adults, 55 or above, as active, as passionate about being in their home or where they live, and be involved with their neighbors, with their social friends. And we have five locations. Our main location is Dev Devon, which we'll talk about. Uh, we're also in Havertown, Media, Broomall, and now East Goshen. Um, we pull the slide there for a second. Our budget's about close to $5 million. Uh, we have 25 full-time employees, 24 part-time, and 80 caregivers. Christy, can mention what this slide's about here? So the, the one thing I want to point out on with this slide that's really fun is this one picture you see of all this group. This is um, this was two weeks ago. This was the Bradner class of 1964. They all met within Surrey from different ways, and that they had their own little reunion. It was very, very nice. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Mm -hmm. And the picture on the bottom, I don't know if you ever read about Mary Saleo. Mary is like an icon for Surrey. She unfortunately passed away about three or four weeks ago. 
uh, 97 years old. She was on our board. She was a caregiver. She was a volunteer. Uh, but she came every day, and she got a ride when she stopped driving to Surrey every day. And so she's been around here Township president for many, many years. So we'll go through how many folks we have around here Township and how we serve them. A lot of people don't realize that Surrey, they think of us sometimes as a senior center. It's one of the things we do. Um, we get about $1.8 million in revenue from our in-home services. That's companion care, financial management, uh, a little later I'll talk about respite care. We have a whole range of in-home services and we work with about 300 clients in the area and this differentiates us from a lot of folks. We're really holistic how we approach aging. We just don't do senior centers. We do whatever it takes to help our older adults. We serve about, we touch about 6,000 people in Delaware, Chester, Little Bit, Montgomery County. In a little while, I'll tell you exactly how many Radnor Township residents we touch. So, Chris, maybe mention some of the neat things we're doing from a, from a service. So, our, our Devon Center, like uh, all of our centers, is this is accredited as well. Um, we have all kinds of programming. We are one of the leaders in evidence based programming um, in the region. We, are, we have more staff trained in Chester and Delaware County than any other um, provider in the area doing this. Uh, we have our fitness center, our meals, 32,000 meals served in our, our cafes every year. And our, oh, you know what I also wanted to mention, we had a program this year, um, our classical music program, which was started by a volunteer, I think about three or four years ago. It has grown, we have about 60 people a week that come. And it just was, a, we got runner up from the National Council on Aging this year, which is a world, a, a nationwide award. So we were really, really thrilled with that. So we're hoping to be able to replicate that and bring it to other areas as well. If anybody's a veteran here, next Monday at the Devon, we actually have uh, a veteran from Pearl Harbor who's going to talk about his experiences. It's really cool. He's 94 years old. 98. 98 years old. Came to our center about three months ago, two months ago with his daughter, totally depressed, was living with his daughter, and when he heard what we do and got involved in our veterans group, now he's perked up and next day he's going to do a presentation next Monday. That's the kind of things we could do. So you mentioned about a holistic approach. We do so many things. People say, how do you do it? You know, a relatively large budget, covering a lot of people. Well, a lot of people help us. First of all, our programs provide quite a lot of our funding. We're fortunate that we do get revenue from our home care and some of our programs we do. Also, our volunteers. We have, if you take our volunteers, they equate to about $1.2 million if we were to pay those folks. So volunteering is a big piece. It's also part of why we started Surrey, is to get people active and engaged. One of our volunteers actually lives in uh, Radnor. She is, works in our finance department. She's been here for 30 years. She's turning 90. Comes three times a week and works in finance. It's like a job for her. Our private funding. So we have foundations. We're really working hard to get foundation support. We're getting ready to expand our cafe because of the popularity of it. We just raised $175,000 to expand our cafe. We also have some folks, high net worth folks, that really love what we do and support us. And then our members do contribute at times. And we're now trying to get plan giving. People will put us in their will. When I got there, we had about 13 people in plan giving. We've tripled that now. We hope to quadruple it in the coming years. And finally, government. And that's where you come in is we do get money from Department of Aging for Delaware County. We just recently started getting money from Chester County. For 30 some years, no money from Chester County. Last two years, we got some funding from Chester County. Um, Malvern provides some funding, media provides some funding, and like yourselves, you provide about 47,500, which is what you've been providing us for the past several years, which we are requesting to stay at the same level. We're not asking for additional funding. So how do we handle it? Well, what we looked at this year, we said, what are the Radnor Township residents that really use what we do? And what we found is the real hardcore Radnor Township is 197 folks that utilize our services, mostly the Devon Center. Those folks provide 90, almost 9,700 different things they do. Every time somebody goes to a class, every time somebody does something in our centers, we track it. So it's 90, and when you look at it, the average is about 50 different things each person does. On-site meals, Radnor Township residents, came to Devon and our meals and Lisa's had our meal are pretty good for four dollars and so we've served close to 2,000 meals. Rides. Surrey started with the rides. We provide rides through volunteers. We also have a relationship with community transit and we also have folks that will pay 
to $23 an hour if they need a ride. We don't do a whole lot of it, but we provided almost 2,500 rides to Radnor Township residents. We have a group of folks from Radnor Township, 47 people, who donated close to 3,500 hours of volunteerism. That equates to 75 hours a year. So that's amazing, and when you look at it, the the funding that we get from Radnor Township is about 1% of our budget, but yet a good portion of our folks that come to our center comes from Radnor Township. Also, our fitness center, uh, the same, actually the same trainer that works in the Wayne Center, also works in ours, and 1,500 trips by Radnor Township residents to our fitness center. So you can see, it's a really, really robust piece, and one of the things I talk about, I think I mentioned it last year, is we're trying new things. So this year, in January, we piled a program. It's called Weekend Respite Program. What it is, if you have a loved one that you've been giving caregiving for, and you need a break, on Saturdays, from 10 o'clock to 3, you bring your loved one to our center, and we have entertainment, games, meals, music, and it is amazing. We had a person that came, she had not left her husband's side for five years. 7 by 24. She brought him the first day. She cried every hour. She kept checking on him. She, then she finally said, I can't believe I have a break in my life. And I don't know if I told the story last year, but I'll tell again this year. This started because about five years ago, I met a couple whose uh, the husband, has father had Alzheimer's. And every day the mother took care of him. And he went to go see his mom, and he walked in the door, and the mother committed suicide right in front of him. And he said, Bob, if my mom had one day of respite, she'd be here today. And that was the genesis of how we started this. And we're now having, every Saturday, we have this. We have a dozen people now. It's growing. It is amazing the difference. So we're trying different things. It, what you see here is actually a picture from the respite care, people doing exercises. It's funny. One of the members, family was in last Saturday, and they were going to see his daughter. And he goes, no, no, I want to see my friends on Saturday. He goes, be every Saturday. So we're trying different things. So we try to have partnerships. We work with Mainline School Night. Uh, we also, Wayne Senior Center, we work with them. We're part of COSA. We try to share programs back and forth. Mainline helps with big partners of ours, of course yourself. And this year we started a new partnership, which I don't have up here, the Wayne Church. If you're with the Wayne Church, we now work with them every Wednesday. Our volunteers uh, deliver four bags of food to 14 people at Trinity House in Berwyn. So we're trying constantly to partner with people. And what we do is really help older adults. And my plea to anybody here is, well, we love the financial help that Radnor gives us. We need more people to come to us, especially lower income people who need help. A lot of people get clustered in their home. They lost a partner. They have no children. And they don't want to reach out. And that's the hardest part of my job, is getting people to come to us. So we always tell people, send them to us. We have four people who work in our member services. Call us up. Whatever you need, we'll figure it out. So real quick, so we, we, we do a survey every year, and you can see some amazing numbers. Go to maintain independence, 96% say. Improved outlook on life, 97%. Improved physical health, 94%. Better access to information services, 91%. That's our biggest problem, getting people to talk to us. And greater socialization and interaction, 95%. You, know, you can read some of those quotes. What I hear, and I love what I do for a living, what I hear from people is, survey's made a difference in my life. And I want to thank the folks at Radnor, the residents, the board, to really help us out. Because without your help, we couldn't do it. So one of the things we have to realize, mm -hmm. people are getting older every day. I'm one of them. I'm one of those <laughs> folks that hit that 65-year-old piece. Every day, 10,000 people will be turning 65. And I will tell you, from my experience, we don't have enough infrastructure to handle people. There's not enough housing. I went to a thing at the mainline uh, chamber last week about poverty and older adults <coughs> as a piece. And we really want to be part of it. Last week, last year, we were named the mainline um, small business of the year and the Chester County nonprofit of the year. So people recognize what we're doing. We're trying really, really hard, and we hope we can continue doing it. So last thing is, that's what we want to do. Engage people, enable them, empower them, and have some fun. Thank you. Any questions, I'll be more happy to ask. There's lots of good information in there. Uh, we'll send you a copy of this deck. And there's a cover sheet that kind of covers the statistics I provide you there. Like I say, I'll be around if you want to ask a question. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Okay, uh, women's resource center. Thank you. All right, thank you. I know
know it's getting late. Thanks everybody for your energy. Um, we're not, we're not going to have slides. We're just going to speak. Is that right? Yeah. It is right. So I'm Karen Basil. I'm the president of the board of directors of uh, the Women's Resource Center. I've served on the board for the last seven years, and I'm um, really honored to be here with you today. Um, I'm here with Cheryl Brubaker, our, our executive director, for the last three years, celebrating yes. her anniversary next month. Yes. Um, we're thrilled to be here. Just wanted to share um, just a little bit about us. You may or may not know we were founded in the township 44 years ago in 1975 by um, several Radnor residents. We are located next to the Saturday Club and across from the library in the CBC Mission House. Um, we've worked with the Central Baptist Church for a long time and we get space from them. And our mission is to um, really empower women and girls and support them in life's transitions. So Cheryl's gonna talk a little bit about our programming and our involvement in the township, but we um, we provide services to women, girls, and families in our community. Good handout, so over to you. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so thank you again for the chance to be here tonight and thanks for hanging in there. Um, as Karen mentioned, we started in 1975. The context of that was, um, if you recall, 1972 was when Title IX was passed. So that was giving women finally the opportunity to pursue any educational opportunities in front of them. And that basically gave women the chance to pursue something that might provide alternatives for financial stability because in the U.S., it, traditionally, women relied upon their marriages to provide that kind of financial security. So having other options, should things not be working well with their marriage, was a lot of what presented them at that time. We've expanded at this point, we work with women in all sorts of situations. But just to remember the context, I think is really important. The other thing that happened just before WRC started was in 1974 was the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Does anybody know what that did? So prior to that, a woman had to, could not get credit on her own. So I don't know if there's any women in the room here that remember. <laughs> you had to have a father or a husband or a brother co-sign if you wanted to buy a dishwasher or a dryer or whatever it might be. And so that also gave another level of opportunity and independence for women. So today we get calls from everything from, um, you know, whether it might be facing divorce or dealing with some aspect of abuse or transition with children or needs of children, needs of aging parents. So we have women call us with all sorts of things that they, whatever challenge or transition they're being faced with, and our job is to help them figure out how to successfully navigate that. And I know a lot of people are familiar with WRC's helpline, the volunteer-operated helpline that's been there since the beginning. And um, I know quite a few folks are familiar with our Girls Lead program, which has been at Radnor Middle School for about a dozen years. And also our legal consultation program, which has local family law attorneys coming in and, and providing pro bono consultation for women on issues of um, divorce, custody, and support. The program I want to talk a little bit about tonight is actually a newer program for us. It's a resource coordination counseling service. And it allows us to be a little bit more involved in helping a woman through a particular transition. Because what we find is women may call our helpline and they'll try one resource or three resources and find out, okay, I don't qualify for this one. Um, this one has a waiting list. And so then they're kind of in limbo, like what do I do next? And in the same time, a lot of women who call us facing divorce are, are, are overwhelmed, dealing with depression, anxiety, um, and so, what this allows us to do, we have a professional counselor on staff along with a wonderful counseling intern, and they provide one-on-one -on -one support. Our average is about eight sessions per client, and that allows them to help leverage both the external resources, but also the internal resources. There was one woman who described coming to uh, uh, her resource coordination sessions like putting herself on a charger, like comparing it to her cell phone charger. She said, you know, I, I would come and get my battery charged up, and then I got renewed to go back and do everything that I needed to do. Um, women have described it as transforming. One woman said it literally saved my life um, going through a traumatic experience in her life. Um, and we have the opportunity to work with women um, throughout the township with a variety of ages, variety of issues. We do still deal with some more emergency types of things. Um, we had the chance to, in fact, the police department was amazing 
in working with us with a woman who had called us and was feeling unsafe in her home and so um, they were able to intervene, help her get an emergency 302. We were able to continue to stay involved with her um, and ultimately support her as she went through this process and eventually decided that she needed to leave for her, safe, for her own safety and, her, and the safety of her children. Um, so it was a great partnership between our center's staff and volunteers and, and the police department. Um, what I passed out to you today shows a little bit about, it has the township's mission and WRC's mission. When it talks about the quality of life for the individual and the community, I think that we are certainly all about supporting the quality of life of the community. And I think there are, there's a good amount of data at this point that shows that investing in women, women and girls will invest in your community, will show impact for your community. So I think we're a worthwhile investment. And I shared a little bit with you about, with our more intensive services, a little bit about what the, our goal is with those services. Um, the cost to WRC for each session is $67 a session. I think that's actually pretty good if you're, if you're going right for um, a private therapist or counselor is somewhere between $120 and $150. Um, we do an average number of sessions of eight per client. The cost per client brings to 536. With the Radnor residents that we served last year, the total cost would have been $25,000, and we're asking you to consider um, funding us for $5,000 a year to be designated specifically for <coughs> Radnor Township residents utilizing WRC services. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. And last but not least, ready one. Don't forget that. Thank you all for your patience. Place to live 
and a competitive place to attract commercial <coughs> entities to locate in our township as we advance in climate change. So who else is doing this? Well, this is a chart of 24 <coughs> townships in southeast Pennsylvania. It does not include anybody in Bucks County. We're not quite sure where they are who have committed to bringing Ready for 100 to their townships. And there are other 23 other municipalities in Delaware County and Chester County and Montgomery County who are working to pass their process. This slide speaks for itself. It is movement. There are 141 municipalities across the United States. And I predict within six months, we're going to have 46 of them. Southeast Pennsylvania is a hot spot. So this is a movement and operate to an opportunity to collabor collaborate and not to be left behind, an important factor. Um, so why do we need a professional uh, planner? Uh, the professional expertise is needed to develop a plan tailored specifically to Radnor and um, that is informed by energy market dynamics and the regulatory context. So we need a plan that's actionable. Um, particularly important opportunities uh, with the analytical depth of a professionally prepared plan are to ensure that the Radnor community has the ability to help shape the energy transition such that it provides benefits right here in the community in terms of programming and opportunities to participate in clean energy development. Um, and secondly, um, to provide a foundation and rationale for Radnor Township's investments in energy savings so that they can be prioritized and bring near-term financial benefits. And to demonstrate the benefits of improved building performance and investments in energy savings for all the community to see. Um, so the Green Team um, conducted uh, the RFP process um, meeting uh, bi-weekly, uh, beginning uh, you know when they first uh, came together, and uh, developed the RFP over the summer. Um, uh, held a, a uh, pre-proposal meeting with prospective firms. It was well attended. We had four firms that presented um, proposals, all of which were uh, tailored to the RFP, um, but they were quite varied in nature. The team. Um, selected uh, a firm that they deemed was uh, best in terms of meeting Radnor's specific needs. Um, in, in particular, um, the firm has a unique uh, depth of expertise and understanding of the Delaware County um, context and um, uh, the energy landscape here. Um, they are uh, particularly focused on civic engagement and also um, committed to um, an in-depth consultation with key stakeholders, uh, um, medical and, and educational institutions, corporate and business uh, entities, and also the faith community. And um, they are committed to um, stakeholder meetings with them, um, at least two and up to an additional four, as needed to really uh, get the kind of in <coughs> input and um, information from those um, uh, entities. So um, the, that was, uh, extremely appealing to the uh, team and their uh, proposal was um, was modest in, in price so um, that's what we're um, putting forward as uh, the proposal so what are we asking the BOC to do simply put we're asking you to commit to approving our funding request which again is not to exceed 40,000 they've allowed for six major stakeholder meetings. If they're not needed, the cost will come down. The payback, the payback is a huge savings for the township. The proposal, not we don't know the investment yet because we haven't put out the RFP, is that this township could save 30% of its energy budget every year. So this township, by doing that, would set an example for what others, the residents, every single household, institutions, corporate business, they can repeat the example set by the township initiative, working together to set the pathway to a clean, prosperous future. So that's what we're asking, simply put. Thanks. And we would like you to do the same. 
Thank you.